The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this light go. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. It is time to keep your appointment. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill, episode 143. My name is Gav. My name is Dan. Oh, your torch bearers through the dark, slimy tunnel of horror movies from yesteryear. Uh, but also from not so long ago. And, and yeah, um, we try to cover a broad attraction. But we yes, welcome, welcome to Haunted Hill. Can't really talk about future movies because we haven't seen them yet. Well, not unless I managed to get the time machine working in a very special way, but um, it only goes back in time. Well, uh, in January, our first episode will be The Time Machine. Indeed. I know Jamie uh, like that. I'll probably have to dust off the uh, some of the gears and get the lube out on some of it. Yeah, get, to, those, get those levers. For anyone who doesn't know, we um, Chris, every January episode we do, uh, we go back in time and look at the year of horror the, from the year just gone because we can't yeah. do it all the time anymore because <laughs> we caught up with ourselves. We went, caught oh, up. You know, have to leave that then. Yeah. But we we are the podcast on all today. Welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome, if welcome, it's your first young, time. old, new. Yes, your first time. Welcome. And if it's not your first time, then you know how rough it can get. <laughs> Hello, and stinky and. <laughs> All other stuff. This is a special episode. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, we we have patrons bragging, but we do. We have patron supporters, and um, one of the the um, benefits of being a patron of the podcast on the Haunted Hill is that every three episodes, it is what is it, Gav? It's a patron pick. We did that so seamlessly. And the thing, annoying thing is. You and I recorded a uh, little musical thing for that. <laughs> we did. We did, and I uh, lost yeah, I find it. it. Yeah, I find it because we were together and we just did it, and uh, yeah, I lost it. I got we it. got in the booth. We sang. You know, we, I, uh, it was like it was like that scene from um, Feed the World. You know, with Bob Geldof and everyone in the studio. We really. Oh look! Oh look! Well, you, you know, listeners, if it comes up some weird musical motif that Dan and I have come up with at the beginning of it in a bit, you know, like I found it, and if it doesn't, I didn't find it. But this patron pick, our patron Rachel has. She wears the crown for this episode. She is the queen, queen patron for the episode. She dictates, and she has dictated what we will be reviewing. Yes. Um, she's also sent me uh, a little blurb as well, a little bit of information. Thank you, Rach. Um, thank you, Rach. Um, we we've known Rachel a long time. Gab especially has known her a lot longer. Um, yeah, she's a real a real Rachel. life friend, as in someone we, we, we've met. Well, Gab has certainly met her several times, and I've met a couple of times um, from back in the day. A long time we've known Rach. Um, she's always been a great friend, very supportive, and you know, in, in the way that she is a patron supporter as well. And Couldn't horror, ask for more. Horror lover. She loves horror. She, she is one of the uh, one of the fold. Yes, she is indeed. Of us. Um, and uh, she's she's an Irish woman with tattoos. So make of that what you will. She is a horror Irish woman with tattoos. She loves her horror, and uh, yeah, she's definitely part of the club, the gang. We love her. We love you, Rach. Bit, she's a bit mysterious she's, now, though, because she's not actually on the internet. I know. It's like she doesn't exist, but then Probably she Probably won't even listen to this. Ooh. Well, if you don't, then up yours. <laughs> no, she will. She will. She will. Yeah, I know she will. Um, she really wanted to actually record with us, but she mentions briefly in her message, I think, um, 
because I'd love to. It's just so yeah. hard. You and I sometimes struggle just to do it on the internet together. Yeah, it just, would be great, and that things. offer that offer definitely is something we'll take you up on someday, Rach. One day when Gab and I get back together, because we do occasionally record in the flash. Just not I often. would say next year we'll, we'll just organise something. Next year I'll yeah. say you come here for a, a long weekend. We can record a couple of episodes, and we'll get Rach over, and, and just say Rach come over as well. <laughs> Yeah, and we just do we'll that do it. in the summertime. Yeah, but um, let's tell everybody what she's chosen for her. So she has chosen two and two films that have a bit of a theme. Uh, um, yeah, okay. Cool. cool. What were you going to say? No, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay, uh, two films that have a bit of a theme. Um, that theme being parents that aren't particularly very nice to their children. <laughs> yeah, I could. I, it's funny, really. I could actually. Um, uh, relate to mom and dad because uh, um, my history of mom and dad is very very frequent and um, uh, Daisy my middle child is, is between 13 and 14 she is now uh, weeks away from being 14 actually makes me oh, yeah, me that I need to actually baby. sort something out and um, she, she's come through the other side she, she, she got to a wall of uh, fuckery I don't know what to call it. I don't know what it was. It's a wall of shitness. I think fuckery is a very good. <sighs> and word. it was, it was extreme. It was, it was extreme. But she's got through it now. And when she was doing that, I actually saw this movie in a charity shop. I went, I'm fucking out for that, and I watched that tonight. And it was my way <laughs> of taking out my anger on her from watching this movie about parents killing their kids. Think what you will of me. You can psycho- think, psychologically think look at will. me any way, way you like, but that was uh, that's my history of it. Reason. So I watched it and I thought that was alright. And um, and I, I luckily had it still the other day to because um, I was going to get rid of it after watching it. I thought it was alright, and I still had it. So watched that copy, which was good. But I I can relate to Rachel because I know she does also have children the same age as me and three of them as well. And um, I know that where she's coming from. So, Rach, I understand. Any other parent out there, I understand. Mm. Uh, I think, it's like, who is that movie aimed at? Is it aimed at youth or aimed at parents? And it's a good mix, actually. I think it's older youth, possibly. Sort of like your 1920s, possibly. And definitely our, our age, you know, who have got kids. I, also, I would also say it's aimed at young teens, because yeah, yeah, the, whole, yeah, yeah. the horror okay. in that is what if your parents yeah. who you're always you hate well, you've got both. what if they actually want to try and kill you that's it, the horror isn't it? it yeah and I imagine that I don't know, some kids when they might have had watched a horror movie and looked at them, I wonder if my parents would kill me and it's like in a, a passing thought not actually absolutely thinking it but you know so it, I guess it relates on different levels um, but, uh, but anyway I'm with Rachel on this on the parent level I well, completely got. Well, I was watching it again, going, "Yeah, I know why you picked this as well." <laughs> well, the two the two movies are one of them you already know now, Mom and Dad. That's Mom. I'm saying it the American way or the Scottish way, Mom and Dad, uh, starring Nicolas Cage and Selma Blair. So we get another chance to talk about the fabulous Mr. Cage, which is always welcome. So thank you to that, Rachel. And the other movie is a very quite a newer movie yeah, from only a couple of years I back. Seen it. It's the first time. Uh, starring uh, modern day screen queen herself Sarah Paulson and that is a movie called Run I, what has she been in then uh, shit tons of horror films Gav uh, <laughs> TV shows American uh, Horror Story she's like oh, everywhere Sarah uh, Paulson I've not, like, not really seen American Horror Story okay she, she's literally like the screen queen uh, the last sort of five or six or more, more years really she's it, she's a fantastic actress she Always must be a very good character actress and I've just not known her in the movie yeah, maybe yeah but yes run from 2020 um, so that is the two movies we will be chatting about hmm. um, I will read your message outrage in parts because when you talk about the films there are a couple of little spoilers and although we do spoil them anyway I feel like it might be better to give us your... I'll read out what you thought of the film after we've talked about it, so that in the wrap-up of each movie. But I will read out the first third of your message before we do that. But before we get to all of that, before we talk about um, you know these movies that our Queen patron, Rachel, has chosen for us, Gavin, how are you? What have you been doing? What's going on in your life, my friend? 
Um, I tell you what I do want to do, uh, what I haven't Ooh. done, and I want to do is I, w- I want to go to the cinema if I can find time to go watch Thanksgiving, Eli Ross new film. Yes, I'd I, like. To I see feel that. like uh, no one's talked about it whatsoever. It's been getting uh, middle of the road reviews. Okay, um, I, I'm well up for it. I'm actually. I'm like thinking like, it'd be nice. Cause it's an original film, so I'm like, so yeah, man. From the Grindhouse fake trailer though, that's why I do love the connection there though. I think we will like it because from what I hear, it's a I very light. So. It's very light on plot, but very heavy on gore and got some really good death scenes. It, 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 he grew up watching the same as us, eighty slashers. So you know, I'm looking forward to his eighty slasher. Eli Roth is. He, he's, he, he's, he's hurt a, me in the past. He's an up and down, isn't he? He's a yeah, seesaw. He's done, he did a couple of good ones, then he did a couple of bad ones, then he came back. It's like, mm. I think it's, it's weird because he goes and does like camera fever, which is a nice jump jumping point. But then like ho- hostels, like a real like boom. Here I am. Yeah. And then didn't do anything again, kind of like that so much. But then he did that um, zombie no uh, cannibal, cannibal film, Green which Inferno. was kind of like. His because he and he does it because he loves that genre of film, and you got to go. I, even though whatever it is, I'm not a great fan of it. It's um, commendable that he made the movie that he wanted to make. And it, again, though, it's still like that. It's quite out there to go and make a. Who else is making cannibal movies nowadays? Yeah. So it was kind of like okay, it's kind of weird. So I don't know. He's such a weird one. But then he goes and makes knock knock with Eli Roth. And you're like, fuck is this shit? I, I quite like knock knock. That's awful. With Keanu. Um, well, I mean, while we're talking about that, and let's have a very quick chat. You and I were just talking about off air. There's a couple of stuff, bits and bobs coming out that we're excited about. One of them is Robert Eggers' Nosferatu movie. Um, I'm excited for this. Uh, I've seen a, a clip of it. Uh, sorry, not a clip, a picture, a still image of it. Um, just a shadow. It looks like it's going to be a lot of use of shadows and music. Um, but I, I really like Robert Eggers, so I'm excited to see what he does with Nosferatu. That'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Um, the other movie, which is not horror, but is 80s, which is still in our our little field of expertise, is um, the uh, Axel Foley movie. Bim, bim, um, bim, bim, bim. Um, uh, yeah, I only literally days ago saw a, a, a picture of Aqua Foley. Why in, in his car. the fuck doesn't Eddie Murphy look a day older than he did in the late 80s? It's crazy. But um, it looks like it might be all right. But there's been a lot of these late sequels like Bill and Ted and a few other I, things that haven't been as good. So, no, Bill and Ted wasn't. <clears throat> um, uh, I'm, I, I'm happy to see. Trouble is, the problem is though with these films, it's who they're marketing it to. They're marketing it to because they, they're trying to get into like a new audience. That's why generally you get like Ghostbusters, you, in, you introduce like the younger characters. Um, but this, unless he's going to, that's probably what will happen in this. There, have, there is Seth, Seth Gordon Green is in it, and there's a couple of younger people in this as yeah, well. Yeah, so that's what's going to happen, because um, you have to. But the entire original only, cast... Otherwise, it's just for us. <laughs> well, the entire original cast is back as well, so... Um, I know, I can't wait, actually. Billy. Yeah, and, and to be honest with you, Eddie Murphy, I, I, I watched a newer film of his a few weeks back. I don't mind called, Eddie Murphy at all, still. There's a film on Netflix called You People with Jonah Hill. Yeah, I haven't seen um, it. Really, he's really funny in it and made me re- remember just how funny Eddie Murphy can be because, you know, he has, like a lot of comedians, got sort of a bit crap for a while there. But um, I feel like that might be quite good fun. You mentioned it. We'll talk about it. The Ghostbusters uh, Frozen Empire trailer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But- I'm happy with that still. That's cool. Yeah, I like snow and ice. I and I like Ghostbusters. Part, yeah. Bill yeah. Murray, they're all in it. Everyone's in it again. Um, so, But this time it's going to be some ice and some snow. In, in It looks like a cross between um, the day after tomorrow and Ghostbusters, where everything freezes suddenly, and then the Ghostbusters have to go and save the day. Fuck no, it, I, I'm into I, that. I, yeah, that's it again. I'm happy to go and watch a Ghostbusters movie in the cinema. I'm happy to watch a uh, uh, Beverly Hills Cop movie. But that's probably Netflix, actually, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is Netflix, that one, yeah. Um, speaking of Netflix, did you check out The Killer, David Fincher's new movie on there, Michael Fassbender? I have not seen it, no. Yeah, check that out. It's kind of weird. Uh, uh, I always use Sarah. Sarah can come down to me because we watch Star Wars. Uh, come down for Star Wars premiere, which we we can talk about in a minute. Um, 
she came down and I always use her as my uh, explanation when I get confused and lost in films, which is very often I sit there and this mist comes over my brain and I go, oh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Sarah. And, uh, and I went, Sarah. And she went, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean you don't know? Why don't you know? She said, I don't know what's going on. Um, but, but I'm liking it and I said like, yeah I'm liking it too but anyway Michael Fassbender it's just him narrating he's quite quiet in the film but it, a lot of him narrating um, um, about just being this um, killer and he, he, he I don't want to spoil it really it's fairly early on he fucks up a, um, a shot and then the rest of the movie is him trying to get that target I think <laughs> because I don't know exactly um, but it was quite enjoyable watching him just kill people Say Michael Fassbender's okay. Um, yeah, Fincher, yeah. you know, did Seven and that. He's, he yeah, Fincher, he what Fincher's a good director. I hated Zodiac, but I like everything else he's done. I tell you what, I did watch as a movie, which is which is really odd movie called Men. Oh God, I fucking hated it. I, I like the fact that you've got um, Rory Kinner, uh, who plays Kinnear, Jeffrey yeah. uh, Kinnear, okay, plays every character. I, yeah. I liked that because that so, was just really back, back kind of rural, like are they all inbred, and that's the idea, I guess. So or, or something. big spoilers. Um, it's I weird. Did, I did talk about this one about six months ago, but oh, it's still a relatively okay. new film. But I watched it because I'd heard, and I know Kate Pollock is a huge fan of this really? um, film, and a lot of people really put this in their sort of top ten of the year when it came out. What was it? Twenty one, twenty two. Yeah, something like that. Um, but I found the whole premise ridiculous. I liked it to until about about for about an hour, and then I the know, end and again I didn't know what was going on. Ridiculous. It was just it, it, if you're trying to say something, just say it. But it felt like it was beating around the bush, and I don't know. It, it felt like there was a really good idea in there somewhere, but the ending just made me hate the film. Really, you know, just uh, a, a, a man giving birth to himself over and over. Yeah. It was just, just like, I was just like oh. which is great. A great it sounds great when you say it, you know. And, and oh yeah, have you seen the end in that film? Where a man gives birth to himself. But but because but when you watch it, you're like, this is shit, really. Well, Sarah's like, oh, you won't like it because like it's body horror and stuff. And I'm not a big body horror fan. Uh, and I watched it. and I was like, no, it didn't bother me because it's blatantly CGI. It's just like. Uh, like I said, it's a great idea. One, every person in this village is the same man playing them. I like that. Yeah, but but that was it, creepy as all shit. But then then but, it's but sadly like, the ending. That, yeah, and, and I can actually um, tangent from that onto a movie that I've watched but with my ve- wife. Very quickly, the naked guy though, with all the spots and stuff over him was oh, creepy yeah. as all shit though as well. That's my new term, creepy as all shit, whatever that means. Um, so I'll springboard onto a movie that I watched from 2022, but I only watched it a couple of weeks back, and that is the one that everyone was talking about when it hit Netflix, and that is Fool. Um, F A W L. You've seen it. A lot of people oh, have. Yeah, yeah. I saw, um, I saw uh, Fryfish. Yeah, and I watched that with my wife. Now I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. It was fucking tense. Um, I, I almost the watched it in the fucking not the first but the second row at Fright Fest on the screen there and I was with Mark and luckily people behind us had gone and, was, and he was like let's go and I was like fuck it and we went back just before it started to like other seats otherwise yeah. we'd have been looking up at this just like what the hell you'd have got a nosebleed uh, it's a great great idea for a single location you know it's kind of like you're 47 metres down all these movies yeah. where someone's yeah. people been there you know my wife even said to me this would make a great double bill with um, Frozen yeah. Um the the Adam Green movie. But um I I loved it. My wife hated the ending because and I I understand you were with this girl all the way through it and there's a great twist which I won't ruin because it's still quite a new film. Um and then right at the end you don't see how she's what happens. The helicopter's just and she's down and that's it. Yeah. Doesn't it, it doesn't show you Oh yeah, that's it. Anything. It just it just ends. Yeah, but I could forgive that. I said to my wife, I forgive that because I enjoyed like it was like a roller coaster ride, and I enjoyed all the loops and twists. And the last part of the roller coaster wasn't that great. 
the, 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 but the enjoy the thing, ride. It, it, it's the fun thing. It's the thing you go to Jason Bloom with with your idea. It's that thing that he goes, "Oh, that's a great idea." It's that someone had to go and make that film at some point, and it got made. And that's why you go watch it. You like the lead up to it. You like them going up it, climbing up it, because you're going, "Ah, you're gonna get stuck," because you're enjoying it. Like the reason I like true crime and shit like that. And then it gets up, but then yeah, then you're there, and then you're like. Uh, we're, it's like you're there with them yeah. but there, there was a good twist in it and there were some clever things that I didn't expect them to do and, and clever obstacles I didn't expect them to have to overcome so yeah, really great I, I yeah, gave it 8 fun. out of 10 I, yeah. I really enjoyed it yeah, um, talking of wild rides Gav I wouldn't give it 8 out of 10 though I'd give it 6 out of 10 uh, I mean I gave it 8 out of 10 yeah but you're, you're very you're very uh, 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 given with your but I think on my next watch it might drop down to like 7 but right now because well, I, I always re that that's still pretty fucking high yeah well, it's a, I thought it was a very good film um, I, know, I know talking of wild rides I went to a Is Greek some... island oh ok it's not like some sort of video collection you used to watch and I watched the film called Island of Death from 1976. Ah, no. You, you, you and I sort of chatted about this a little bit, and I went, yeah, that's one for me and Sarah. But not, no, actually, that's going to sound bad when you actually explain what it's about. That's going to sound about... really bad. But it's a weird thing that Sarah and I would probably watch, not really what it's about, Q Dan. It, well, let me put it this way. I'll list some of the things that you will see in this film. And this is not why I thought it'd be for me and Sarah. Disclaimer. Bestiality. Mainly, mainly a goat <laughs> getting fucked up the arse um, pissing on people <laughs> murder uh, heroin um, people getting their faces melted off with an aerosol can and a candle people getting thrown in a pit of lye to rot away in the rain um, someone getting buggered up the arse in a, a farm hut um and I mean, there's there's probably about thirty other things that I can. Oh, two people decide to have sex in front of one of their mums just to annoy her. Um, basically, this is a film that was made by what's the director's name? Let me just find it for you. Um, he wanted to um, make a film that would be as shocking as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Obviously, this came out in 1976, this film I'm talking about. It's by Nico Mastorakis. And basically, it's about a man and a woman um, who... And I'm not... You know, this is this is a very old film, so it's no spoiler. It turns out they're brother and sister as well. But it's a, a pair of lovers who are like Bonnie and Clyde, and they're really... They're into killing and mutilation and raping as many and people and animals as they can. And they're American, and they get to this Greek island, and they just cause chaos on this Greek island. And everybody on the Greek island is like, well, people keep dying on this island. I don't understand what's happening. And then there's a cop trying to hunt them down who's come over from America uh, or the... Or, london i can't remember where he's come from and it's just it really held my interest it, and i cannot i cannot for the life of me tell you how it made its way onto my watch list someone must have suggested it to me years ago i put it on and by the time it, within 10 minutes there's a goat being buggered by a man and i'm thinking what what am i watching here yeah but by the end of it i was like that was great these two horrible people got everything that was coming to them but also, there was quite a lot of twists and turns and uncomfortable scenes. I had to pause it a few times because Alice was in the room and I was like, apparently this next scene is pretty bad. And she went, OK. I went, do you want to leave the room? And she went, uh, no. I went, right, well, I'm going to pause it because I don't want you to see <laughs> what's coming up. Because some of it was re like, it's, it was a video nasty. It was banned for years. Yeah. So I had to pause the end 20 minutes until she'd gone to bed and then I watched all the terrible buggery happening <laughs> oh the wife's gone to bed turn back on the buggery <laughs> but I recommend Island of Death you can rent it on Prime it's you know but but it's a, it's a bear in mind it's one of those video analyses that I can understand exactly why it was banned some of them you're like why was that banned but this one should have been banned um and it's tame compared to things that are out there. But uh, I, and I just uh, disclaimer just thought Sarah and I would like that, but not for those reasons. When I told Gav, dear listeners, about this, he was like, "Oh, Sarah's good." As soon as I got to the bit about goats, out of me, he was like, "What? She's gonna love this." I didn't say. That. <laughs> she didn't. She's not he into didn't, goat I mean, bumming. Sarah. She's, Sorry, a, Sarah, she's a very I good vegetarian. 
Cheers. Yeah. Um, anything else you've been watching? I've got a couple more, but is there anything else you've been watching? Uh, I, uh, it's not horror, but I really enoy watching the other day. As uh, uh, Elijah's over now, but he's kind of ignoring me. He's watching YouTube or something. I was kind of so I kind of watched a movie on the TV in the background, and if he's in the room. <laughs> He's nine, you know. Uh, I can only watch certain stuff. But he is swearing all the time, but I can't sort of show for too much, whatever. So it's quite hard finding, like, a movie which would be interesting for me, which is just could go in the background, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and it just came on Prime. I really enjoyed watching it, but it's not horror, but it's the original Taken of Pelham 123 from 1974. Oh, the original, yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen that. really enjoyed it. And I recommend uh, People like our, our, us blokes at our age... Um, I watch it again. It's really enjoyable. The seventies, early seventies, and I have a shout out to RJ McCready here, our, our fellow podcaster and friend. He's going to be into these sort of movies as well. There's something about those mm. er, early to mid seventies action thrillers. Yeah, it's they not did, that action. They were, they were, though, this. But there was a bit. They're quite. Those sort of movies are quite groundbreaking when they came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do like it, but yeah, it's not like mad action. It's not like French Connection or something. Um, but um, around the same era. Um, but no, it's really enjoyable. And obviously, Thingy's really good. Um, who's in Jaws, you know? Roy, Roy Schneider? No. Rob Schneider? No. Th- Adam Sandler? No, Quint. Oh, that guy. What's his name? Quint. <sighs> I thought you'd know. That's terrible of us. Anyway, uh, he's like the main bad guy, the main robber. Um, he's in it that's right um, yeah really good film really enjoyable Robert, Robert Shaw that's it uh, really enjoyable actually yeah oh yeah it's a good movie um, I haven't really watched other than that older Island of Death goat buggery movie most of what I've watched recently has been quite new I actually watched a 2023 movie which I think you might have seen a lot of people are talking about it it's on um, Disney Plus uh, it's also on Hulu if you're in America and that is No One Will Save You Oh, was that that alien one? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, I think I can understand why some people don't. I really liked it. It's Marmite, Marmite movie. I didn't, I didn't like it for the reason that a lot of people are like it's so good because no one speaks in it. I don't care about that. That's a good. That's an interesting thing. That annoyed me. I wanted someone but, to talk. Um, yeah, but no one's going to talk in it because she's on her own for most of it. So I get, I get why that is the case, and I, I really liked parts of it. Um, I've heard. Some people say they really didn't like the flashback stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to spoil it because I'm, I'm, it's brand new. It only came out like a month or so ago. But I think if you if you like alien invasion movies, if you like signs, there's definitely some... For me, there were some moments in it where the aliens were coming in her house or she was upstairs and she could hear them walking around. Really creepy stuff. And some of the alien stuff looked really good. And Although it was a bit too much CGI at times, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'll probably watch it again because I didn't quite get how the flashback stuff tied in. I had to go back and read up on it afterwards. And now I understand the subplot. When I go back and watch it again, I'll probably get it a bit, get a bit more out of it. But that's, yeah, if you've got Disney Plus or Hulu in, the, in America, then um, no one will save you. You've probably heard a lot of people talking about it. It's an alien invasion movie. You don't get a lot of those. So I'll, I'll take any that I can get, really. Um I've got one more to talk about. Um, what about you? Do you have any more before I... Nah, nah, nah. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, Sten- uh, the Stendhal Syndrome. D- did you have a good Halloween, by the way? I did, yeah. Very good, thank you. Because, you know, it's past us till next year and we never we never really sort of do that. We always do the Halloween episode, but that's yeah, actually on that's, Halloween. That's true. No, I did. I watched Silver Bullet. Um, okay. about 10 o'clock at night I, I fell asleep I managed to push my 31 in and I fell asleep uh, through Halloween the original oh, well you've seen it a million times I think that's it yeah. and also it's such a comfort blanket but I made it 31 and that was it so I kind of did 30 and a half I obviously I don't not obviously you know this but our listeners don't I, I've, I'm currently in the middle of being sober I haven't had a drink for a very very long time months and months and months so normally on Halloween I'd probably have had a few drinks but I was still laughing my ass off at um, um, pissing on the Indians pissing on the Cowboys in Silver Bullet towards the end of that uh, movie it's just it's, uh, Uncle Red is just a force of nature it's amazing so I enjoyed that 
But yeah. yes, no, thank you for asking that. And actually, I do have something to link in back into that in a minute. Yeah, go for it. Um, about Halloween. But um, just very quickly, I watched Dario Argento's Stendhal Syndrome, which I'd never seen before, and I thought it was terrible. So I'm not going to waste your time talking about that. Never seen it before. Really excited to check out um, an Argento movie. Hated it. Asia Argento stars in it. Awful. Didn't like it. Some people might like it. Fucking hate it. But one movie I did watch, which you and I have talked about, but I just wanted to let the listeners know, uh, is a superhero film, but a very dark superhero film. And I'm talking about 2022's Batman. I was unwell. I had an after. I took two days off work sick. That's how unwell I was. Nothing to worry about. It just couldn't shake a headache. Felt really shivery. Kids were at nursery. It was raining outside. It was very grey. This film is three hours long, so I figured if there's a better, not a better time to watch this Batman film, let's do it. So I put a blanket over me and watched it, and I fucking loved every second of it. I loved the score. I loved Robert Pattinson. I loved the um, the Penguin, Colin Farrell. I loved the Riddler. I loved the sort of the the, the Seven slash Silence of the Lamb style detective work. It was really dark and gritty. It was really violent as well. Um, it was a bit like Saul at times, you know, with the traps and the way that people were killed. And I really, you know, I, I, came out, I came out of it like I want to give this like a 9 out of 10, which feels crazy. Um, but it currently sits at 9 out of 10 for me as a, a, as a non-Marvel superhero film. You know, and it's obviously it's not related to any of the DC stuff that's out right now, but... It's fucking great. You you got it on Blu-ray in one of your big treasure troves of Blu-rays, didn't you? Yeah, I flogged it. I Did I you like it though? No, nah, it was still sealed, so I flogged it. Oh, okay, but you but you <laughs> have seen it, there, right? No. Nah. Oh fuck! I thought you'd seen it. No. Nah. That's a shame. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get around to it. It seems maybe a little bit interesting. I might watch it, but uh, you know. Yeah, you just need to. Like I said, it's close to three hours long, so you need to give yourself. A nice window of time to really f- i think you'll like it it's raining in every single scene it's dark it's proper gotham you know yeah, and that, that's that sort of stuff uh, appeals to me more than a, a marvel film you know yeah i think you'll really like it it's it's fantastic really fantastic mm. um you mentioned halloween so i want to swing back around i've got a couple of things i want to mention um to fellow podcasters um first of all halloween i wanted to i forgot on our last episode to thank our good, good friend and podcasting brother from Legion, uh, Ricky, Ricky Morgan, um, because he actually did a very special thing for me. Um, he does a show, he does many shows, as a lot of people know, but his current main show is Dr. Movie MD, and he drops about five episodes a week. They're about 20 minutes long, 15, 20 minutes long, covers absolutely anything. So he's already got up to like episode, I think he's coming up on his 300th episode fairly soon. If I remember rightly. Anyway, he takes requests and he's a good friend of mine and vice versa. So I requested, because I was in the middle of doing lots of werewolf movies for Halloween for October, I requested, hey buddy, what's your, you know, your top three werewolf movies? Maybe you could cover your number one werewolf movie of all time. Well, what he actually did, because he couldn't decide, was he gave me and the listeners of his show about 10 episodes in a row of his favorite werewolf movies uh and so that was such a nice little honor that he did for me where he did like basically 10 episodes in a row that were all werewolf movies covering you know all the classics and finishing with his top favorite werewolf movies of all time which were i think it was the howling dog soldiers ginger snaps and american Werewolf in london they're all of his top ones but he loves bad moon he loves silver bullet he loves all the other random ones as well so i wanted to thank ricky for that also wanted to give a shout out to another legion brother of ours or brothers court and matt psyops of cinema psyops who i've done 450 i think ish episodes weekly and they've never missed a week don't know how they do that um the reason i'm saying shout out to them is i know courts had a bit of a shit time these last couple of weeks i know he listens to our show so i just wanted to say i'm glad that you're back on your feet my friend and i cannot believe you still haven't missed a single episode i know that you store episodes up You've, it's no secret just in case there's a week where you and, and matt can't get together but you, you're amazing so big up congratulations to you guys keep on trucking nine years they've, been, they've never missed a week Gav. That's, good. that's good isn't it nine years yeah we, we they've can't not missed a week 
we can not get up to 10 years next month um yeah which should be our special episode, but we're not even sort of mentioning it. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, we, we've missed months at times. Um, and the last podcaster I wanted to mention is one of our patrons. And I completely forgot um, that Don Collier, one of our patrons, also has a podcast. Um, he always says it's not very frequent, but it has been getting more and more frequent. And it's available on Spotify. And I've listened to every episode. I think there's a good six, seven, maybe even eight episodes out by now. Um, and it, if for anyone who's interested, it's called Found Footage Horror with Donnie Darko. So he goes by the name Donnie Darko as a podcaster. Um, if you can just type in Found Footage Horror with Donnie Darko, and he covers only found footage films. Yeah, I need to check it out. I do apologize for that. Do, uh, not listen to it so far uh, because I do like found footage. I used to listen to a found footage podcast, um, but that stopped. But yeah, I promised him I would um, just give him a shout out. Well, I didn't promise him, but I, I told him I would, and I completely forgot. But um, here I am, my friend, and thank you for your support as always. Uh, and I do listen to your show, and I love your show, and it's great to hear someone just talk about a little dedicated pocket of the podcasting world that is just um, found footage. So there we go. And we should get on to the episode, but just before but we do... we have one more thing to talk about, don't we, Gav? Uh, uh, well, everybody finally. by now... I, uh, finally. Everybody finally. by now, I presume, who's listening to this, because you're hassled enough, is probably watched uh, Star Wars Sanctuary Moon, which we made, which came out. Yay! Clap, clap, clap. Finally did it. <laughs> After a lot of work, uh, it came out. So y- y- now you know what we're talking about when we're just muttering on about fucking Star Wars. You know what it is now because you can see it and go, oh, that's what they're going on about. And we can spoil it, it now because if it's, you're you know. just to say, if you're online, um, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, you should have you seen have us seen posted about it by now. If you haven't watched it, it's only twelve and a half minutes. <laughs> Take, I take think the, it's take worth credit your time. Out, it's less, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's worth your time. We're incredibly proud of what we've achieved. Um, yeah, it's, not, it's doing all right. It's got less than uh, a it's week. Been, it it's been, been about a week, long. not even, and it's five and a half thousand views. So about a thousand views a day, which yeah. is fantastic. Um, but yeah, uh, if you struggle, if you're listening to this episode right now and you struggle to find it anywhere, hit me up, and I'll I'll link you up with it. But it's on YouTube, Star Wars Sanctuary Moon under Deadbolt Films. It's on Facebook. It's been posted links everywhere. Instagram. You should be able to catch it and got, tell us what you think as well. Yeah, and it's got really good response. You know. It's a weird thing to tell people when you say, oh, I've been making a Star Wars film. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? I'm saying, mm. uh, yeah, it's like a fan film. And they're like, they, I, I imagine that they think it's you and at least maybe two two mates and you're both in the woods. One of you's got a Darth Vader fucking costume with a fake plastic lightsaber. And the other's got a camcorder and you're like, look like India Jones or some shit. That's what they imagine. And you're jumping around going, yo, bow, bow, bow. That's what they think. And it's like, no, no, this wasn't <laughs> no, this that. Is, um, this was not that. So we can now talk about it. So this is essentially what would happen if um, Predator and Star Wars... Collided. Collided. <laughs> uh, but take out the Predator, replace that with very hungry Ewoks, who we don't really see. Uh, they're, they're little, we just get their POV and their little blinking red eyes in the dark and their little whapper whapper noises. It'd been very expensive to have lots of Ewok costumes. And their neurotoxin darts and their um, rocks and their, you know, everything that they use, their weapons and stick traps. Um, and we've got three great actors in it. And we've got some amazing props and 3D printed stuff and costumes and acting and writing. And yeah, guys. Picture looks really good. Yeah. It looks good. It sounds good. It's got the screen wipes. You know, there's some good special effects that aren't over the top they're just there just to remind you this is a star wars film you know it feels like a star wars film it really really genuinely looks like a star wars film where the location we shot at we're so lucky because my dad actually said to me you know it looks and he said i know it's supposed to daniel but it really looks like another planet which was a very lovely compliment because i know i know what my dad means when he says that you know it does look like another planet uh, you know you can fully really believe this is the the forest moon of endor yeah um a filmmaker which most people on here have watched quite multiple of his films actually said it looked very professional and uh, mm. uh yeah he really enjoyed it and i was like cool 
And of course, it's completely dedicated to our good, good late friend Boz. Yes, yeah, so, I've, yeah. I've been doing the behind the scenes the past couple of days, and uh, just putting that together, and I've sort of chopped that together. And yeah, that's you know, uh, Boz is in there and stuff. But you have to kind of uh, put your put your emotions in a in a box, and yeah. uh, just sit there and just work away making a behind the scenes thing. So he he would be incredibly proud of it and happy. And he his film is the best. It, his film is the best film in the in the behind the scenes stuff. Of course it is. It's ga- it he's, is. he's panning. He's the only person that does actually any filming. <laughs> he like be zoomed in and he zooms out. and Shows everybody. Or he pan from left to right real slow to show the whole location because he he oh. knows what he's doing because he did it for the blinds, and but um, no one else did. Like you know, there's at least in different chunks but together is at least 35 minutes of cardboard boxes or the grass stuff like that which yeah, someone thought they were filming like really good someone's thought they were filming something really good and obviously pressed pause and then put it down and press record and like yeah. oh for fuck sake. My, my speech as I say oh at the beginning like I did a little talk to everybody you're saying you know this movie's gonna be with us forever once we're gone and all this sort of stuff and you know anyway uh not there but, but but yeah, so we're getting we've we've only had one not even negative it's really just negative. once. Someone said the music's a bit loud, and I understand. Yeah. Like, like yeah, the, no, I get I, that. There was the version of it I did where I turned the music right down, and it was a lot quieter. But it, it's also it's the only thing I'm egotistical about because <laughs> I'm a musician. I'm like play it loud, louder, turn hmm. it to eleven. I'm like spinal tap. Well, that's the only thing but as a director and editor I'm actually not like oh that's that scene's really that shot's so good I'm going to leave it for fucking 10 minutes no, no I'm like no chop 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 but music well the, yeah. the, the music and so the I score get are getting, getting a lot of praise as well so yeah and we've released the uh, score on YouTube now as well we've YouTube channel's like really tidied up now it's got yeah. all like new uh, thumbnails all the videos and um, yeah we've got plans So not so much crap of just me and Gab no. And uh, we're having a little deadbolt uh, curry on Monday night. So we could talk about our next, next uh, move. So, yes. On this chessboard. Anyway, do check out the movie. If you know anyone like Star Wars, get them to uh, share it as well. But let's get on this fucking show because this is dwindling now. Let's do this fucking thing. Let's do this. So, uh, before we go into our first trailer, then, because we're going to cover Mom and Dad first. Mom and Dad. Um, it would be remiss of me not to read out our Queen Patron Rachel's or the first part of her message. Um, so, I'll read this out, and then we'll go into the trailer. And then when we come back, we'll we'll talk about Nicolas Cage and his Sawzall. It's called a Sawzall because it's saws Oh, Anyway, we'll be doing that a lot. <laughs> I should imagine. I imagine Uh, you will be doing that a lot. Rachel says, she starts off by doing an impression, unintentionally, of Sloth from the Goonies. She says, hey, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) But in an Irish woman's accent, I should imagine, not in a, hey, you guys. (laughs) I imagine not. (laughs) I hope not. Anyway, sorry. She says, hey, you guys. Thanks so much for asking me to take part. Bless her. She's a patron. Of yeah, course. of course, every, your patron. Um, you have to. She says, I'm a long time fan of the podcast, and I'm blessed to have you two as friends. We will record together someday. My fierce Northern Antrim accent will be largely unintelligible to the majority of your listeners, but Gav has always assured me that it's actually not that hard to understand. Although I, I can understand her fine, yeah. Yeah, she's fine. Although the blank faces of most of the un- other English people I talk to always says differently. But you're my friend, so I'll take your word over there whenever someone says, sorry, what? Um, she says, I have picked two films, Run by Anish Chagamrati and Mom and Dad by Brian Taylor. It was really hard to settle on two films because there are so many good movies out there. It's so hard, right? It's really hard. Every, I, I've got my birthday episode coming in January and I've got one solid, but then the whole time I'm like, ah, what I've been on it, Gav, it? for six months to come up with a pairing. I'm still not totally 100%. Um, and what I, Rach, before I continue reading your message, what I would really appreciate, and maybe you did this unintentionally, is you've, you've put a bit of a theme, you know, with this as well, as to parents potentially hurting their children. So um, I really appreciate you've done that, whether it's intentionally or not. Um, she says, it was really hard to settle on two films because there's so many good films and because you guys have um, been podcasting for ages at this We've stage. Done a lot, yeah. And have a lot of reviews in your back catalogue. You stay out of my back catalogue. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She didn't say that. I just added that. Um, 
I'm going to stop there because she now goes in to talk about Run, and then she talks about Mum and Dad. So I will pause it there. You, we'll you, go and review Mum and Dad. And then, you, oh, and then you do that one, and then and after then, Run, you do the Run one. Run, yeah. run, 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 run. Run, 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 run. You do Run, run, run. You do, you do run, 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 run. Okay, uh, that sounds cool. Should we uh, listen to a oh, wee trailer? Yes, indeed. Um, let's go into a trailer with Nicholas Cage. Cage. And it's we'll be trailer. back. Uh, can I go to a movie with Riley tonight? With Riley? Your grandparents are coming for dinner tonight, remember? Awesome! Grandpa telling his disgusting Vietnam stories. Take my advice, don't ever have kids. Mm. Everything just revolves around you, doesn't it? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> what is the rush today? It's like they're waiting for a buffet. What's going on? Is that McKenna's mom? Multiple reports are now coming in of parents murdering their own children. Listen to me. We have to get out of the house before mom and dad come home. from 2017 oh, rated 15 oh yeah <laughs> a teenage girl her and her younger brother must survive a wild wild 24 hours during which a mass hysteria of unknown origin causes parents to turn violently on their own kids um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so Nicholas this is Cage. Directed- Yep. Yeah, well, we'll get on to him in a minute. Just very quickly, the director is uh, a chap by the name of Brian Taylor, and he has directed Crank 1 and 2 with Jason... With Jason fucking Statham. Have you seen Crank or Crank 2? Yeah, I think I've seen both of them. Yeah, l- lots of sort of it's Red Bull... the early, early Statham, wasn't it? Early Statham. Yeah, yeah he fa- he's done fucking... Fuck he give a fucking shit. Um, he also directed Gamer, which is another very extremely violent... Gerard Butler, but I've never uh, seen it. Yeah, it's good. He also directed um, the Ghost Rider sequel with Nicolas Cage. Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. Oh, yeah, I saw the first one. I don't... There's a famous scene in that where um, Nicolas Cage is trying to keep the Ghost Rider from coming out. And he says to the guy, I can't keep him inside much longer. Can you hear him? He's scratching at the door. And he does this like really weird. So this guy has directed a lot of weird shit. Um, and the most recent thing he directed was Happy, which is that Netflix show, which I never saw about a, a cartoon unicorn, which gets a guy to go around killing people. I think it's in his mind or something. But he did direct Mom and Dad in 2017. Okay. Um, so let's talk about it. Now, Rachel obviously likes this movie. That's why she's picked it. However, we won't read out her little bit about it until the very end, because there may be a couple of little spoilers in there. And although we do spoil, we want to kind of like go through the movie um, as, as we like to do. And then we'll talk about our thoughts at the end and, and throw Rachel's into that pot. So this is uh, my third time of watching this now. Probably your second or third time now, Kevin? Uh, second time watching it, yeah. Second, yeah. Um, um, it's interesting because um, it's not going to be... Um, it's weird, in a way. I don't know. It is and it isn't. No, it is. Um, 
the film, <sighs> the, the director obviously had a look and a, and a style, but I don't know why this <clears throat> chose this sort of style, but, but then the style isn't all the way through the film. But like, the opening credits is like, we're watching a giallo. Yeah, it's like a giallo or a grind house, isn't but it? But, like, and then there's not a lot of stuff like that in the film, and it's kind of weird. Um, there is a couple of things here and there, a couple of close-up stuff here and there. It has a bit of an artsy look to it sort of thing, but it's just kind of, I don't know, it's just strange, but I kind of like that, but it put me in the wrong... What I was thinking was coming up, it didn't give me. It already put me somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. I think um, for someone to watch this just the first time, uh, or maybe revisit it a few years later, you won't really... You'll just watch it, and you'll enjoy enjoy the ride. But I think... You're right. There's inconsistencies in style. Now, I, I like this film. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to be praising majority of it. There's a few bits I, you know, a bit of, I will critique. But you're right. There's some inconsistencies in style, mm. um, for sure. Like the opening credits make you think you're going to be watching some kind of giallo slash um, the Grindhouse movie, which... I suppose there are elements of Grindhouse in this, but... There is some stylish thing. And I, again, one thing in here, like, the the role of music supervisor uh, oh, wow, was yeah. is, was invented for... Uh, it's basically a DJ for a movie. They mm. are choosing the songs for the film, going, this is the song you need for this film, da, da, da. obviously working with the director and their vision. Um, uh, but this, the person that did this, I'm guessing, it's quite an indie film, I imagine. Uh, I don't know. I don't imagine it's a huge budgeted film. Film. Um, I'm not sure. It might have music supervisor. Oh no, it probably does. Anyway, they were brilliant. The the use of songs in this is yeah. fantastic. It does give it a style choice, definitely. When you've got juxtaposition between like 80s pop shit with like carnage, mm. it's it's really well done, and that's definitely a style going on as well. So th there is something going trying to go on here, but I, I don't know if they. It's kind of like also the film. One day they're sitting around in the in the pub and went I've got an idea for a movie what, what if like Covid it's like Covid but there's another virus and uh, it just made all the parents want to kill their kids yeah, that's a brilliant idea and, and then what I don't know we, 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 we I, won't finish it we, and right, we've you're got right. a great idea and that is a good premise you know what if it's a, yeah, 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 and, and it's, I don't need to know they never go into what is caused this they yeah. talk about was it a chemical warfare attack or something I, we don't care about that um, yeah you just want to see the the premise yeah, that's uh, why Jason and, uh, Blumhouse buys these premises off these people. And I, I think the reason why that works, that premise worked and appealed to people to give this a budget, is because, like we talked about in, the, in our intro to this episode, I think um, kids, famously, when you're 13, you hate your parents, you think they're dicks, they don't understand you, and if you watch this at 13, it might make you think shit. What if my parents actually wanted to kill me, like yeah, Nicolas Cage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the but, fun bit. It, it, this is the movie and the, <clears throat> the essential. We have our playground nowadays. We had as a kid telling each other, "What movie did you see? That movie." We have it now in internet forums. We have it on our own podcast page. That is our playground. And uh, someone will say, "Have you checked out this movie or stuff?" And it's um, this is the, and the reason for this movie. Have you checked out this movie? The parents just want all to kill the kids. That's the fun concept, and I was happy watching it for that. And then I will give this a pass for that concept and stuff, and I enjoyed that. There's just no revol re like resolution to it, which is just a bit like, okay, yeah, it's fun. Shame. It's, it's, it's Shame. a fun ride. You, they could have come um, up with an ending. I'll tell you where they could have gone wrong. They could have not had Nicolas Cage in this, and he thrown who Nicolas Cage. Done, in who would have done it instead? Fuck knows, but I'm so. Steven Seagal. So, no, no, I'm. The, <laughs> Can you imagine? He can't do any running. I'm imagining somebody like John Cusack, you know, or, or someone like that. Um, or um, what's his name? Uh, not John Cusack. What's the other guy I'm thinking of? Kevin Bacon. Someone like that could have perhaps done it. But I think Nicolas Cage, really, you're here to see Nicolas Cage wants to cut his kids up with a chainsaw. Um, that's what you're here for, really. Yeah, I, I suppose you have got the sort of... You do get the same sort of types of people. you got your Nicholas Cage, Kevin Bacon, same sort of white, uh, same sort of age, uh, uh, all-rounder. And they can do some uh, good and, rage at and, times. Uh, um, thing with Ethan Hawke would sort of sit in there with them, you know. In his cardigan. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you do get these, and Nicholas Cage is definitely that as well. But uh, he's, I do, he's I, the he's the madcap one, I, except with Nicholas Cage. Though, uh, the <clears> fact, <throat> fact that he has he's had this res, uh, this new uh, coming again, yeah, a renaissance of that's, his that's career, the, isn't it? Yes. And um, but I do love it. A couple of fantastic movies with like Mandy and Cut Out of Space. And um, just just movies where he can just let his freak flag fucking fly, and he just, yeah, for he sure, just, man. He just goes, "I'm going there." Um, I would, I would, I would absolutely adore, love, I would just go. Oh, it probably jizz if I could direct or work with Nicolas Cage. I would go fucking. I would go out there. <laughs> I'd be yeah. like, dude, we're going fucking out there. There's a couple of scenes in this that he is so good in. The scene where he's talking to his young son. I'd about... be, I'd be running through the woods naked with him. When he's when he's talking to his young son about, he's, when he's giving him advice, doing, dude, we, you fucked up. I fucked up too one time. And he's sort of t- he's talking to him like he's a grown man, but he's like a nine year old kid. It's just so good. Um, yeah. Also, we got Selma Blair in this, who is very boxy. What, what's I don't know, not my sort of thing. What um what has she been in then? I need to check her out. She's she's got a bit of a scream queen. Yeah, um, I, I must be just not knowing the anybody anymore or something. Cause I yeah, she was she was in the original Hellboy one and two, Cruel Intention. She was a bit of a nineties, um, you know. Okay. But she, yeah, it's not movies for me though. That, again, that's why I don't really know them. She's semi-retired from acting now. Um, oh, okay, actually, I believe she has multiple sclerosis now. Oh, bless um, her which is a shame uh, for her, but I, I know that she's doing okay, but she's just not, not well physically because of that. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think she's doing much acting. Now I must just mention, um, in, in, in anger, I don't know, I just saw a page in anger management, a show that she was on, she'd get paid 40,000, uh, an episode. Imagine that. Oh, pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. But then, oh, then, then the agents and everybody else takes their cut. On a serious note, I must just mention this, um, was not fun my from my my wife alice um who has she meant she said i could mention this and i won't go into great detail but she meant she has some ptsd um from when she had our twins and sort of just just after having the twins and the way that she was treated in the hospital blah 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 i won't go into detail um but because she because of that it affects her mental health quite badly for the first part of our baby's lives and she had some dark thoughts some intrusive thoughts and this film was a little bit triggering for her to the point that i had to turn it off um although it is a zany crazy black comedy it's still people trying to really i mean it's not it's, not, uh, it's uh, a it's uh, a gory uh, film it's not just their children yeah slap the kids around they're trying to bottle their kids or cut them up or, or throttle them yeah, yeah, yeah. you know run them over so yeah um alice was not a fan of this which is weird because she watched run but i think run is done a little bit a little bit differently a little bit more subtly um yeah but yeah um i just wanted to mention that it may trick you but also it's mental film as well so well bless bless alice for that um and that's uh, obviously horrible um uh, the difference between these two movies, really, I think it's the rage, isn't it? It's a speedy rage. The other mm. one's a slow burn. This is your 28 Days Later the one, style. The other one, you don't see <clears throat> the violence. It's just subtly done because it's mm-hmm. like an, a, a tablet here or there or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, this is outright in your face. From, there's, a, there's a razor blade in your face there. <laughs> Child off camera, but, you know, obviously. But yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Well, we'll we get into it. and um, Yeah. Like I said, brilliant soundtrack, very well used. If you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I mean. Like the juxtaposition is basically what they've gone for when they can. And when you do that, it always brings like almost a, a fresh uh, scent of comedy in the air. Yeah, it's always um, it's always fun to have an upbeat song on Where's while something Alan really crazy. Something. Yeah, you do, my friend, the Bracken. The Bracken. Um, well, let's get into this. So there is a little bit of, I mentioned John Cusack, and there is a little bit of cell in some ways, because there is a static TV and radio signal that's going out, um, just like there is in cell, which is causing anybody who's got children, um, as soon as they see their child after they've heard this noise, they just want to kill them. But they're, they're still themselves. 
which is weird. It's not like twenty days later where you lose your mind. No, you, if you if you're like you uh, uh, another person was there in a the room, anyone else apart from your children, yeah. you'd be like, "Do you want some ice cream?" No worries. Hang on, I'm just going to fucking slice these. Oh, kids hang on, up. there's my son. Come here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very, very, very quickly. The music over the credits, by the way, was. Um, I was just like, this, this could you could drop this on the Jackie Brown soundtrack. Thought you can say a Jackie Chan film then. You could drop this on a Jackie Chan soundtrack, and uh, no, Jackie Chan. Uh, oh, fuck it off, Jackie Brown film. <laughs> Um, oh, put, put in Jackie Chan in my head. Um, a Jackie Brown uh, soundtrack. It was just so much. And that's why I said the filters. It, it took me totally off to what then came out. Um, and my wow. next note was a shame the film didn't keep to this. And it is. Um, okay, so let's just get straight into it then. So well, there's a film. Signal, then. <sighs> yeah, so th- we hear the TV static. You know, we find out later on what it means. But there's a woman in a car with a baby. And we open, and this is why my wife wasn't a fan. We open with this woman getting out of her car, leaving the baby in the back seats, and then you realise she's part of the car on the train tracks. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's a very passing, a uh, uh, fleeting moment, actually. It's and you're just like, quick. wow, okay, we're going here. Yeah, straight away. It was like straight into that, like which was like a very, which is obviously a choice. Um, and we don't see it. But we do see Gore later on. But, like, so fast, as in, like, you don't know who the person is. There's nothing like that. It's just literally, like, it's just going to show you what is going on right now. Um, I, I I don't know. I almost has to say that almost it, it's rushed into too quickly, almost. Like, uh, they struggle to know what to do with the ending. I'd say maybe, like, maybe bring it in a little bit slower, more in a Stephen King-type way in the town. You know, even like more like that, um, a bit more like the happening with uh, Wahlberg. Uh, which I only saw for the first time um, uh, last year. Kept it in my DVD collection because I was like... After, it's not that bad. After COVID, go and watch it again now and imagine COVID. And it's kind of a bit like, that's kind of weird. Because it's, it's talking on the same level. You can, you can re- I related to that movie because of I know COVID. what you mean. Yeah, it's I weird. Mean. Anyway, um, this film, yes. See, Rachel, you're making us talk about M. Night Shyamalan and Mark Wahlberg films now. Come on, bro. It's the plans, bro. Come on, bro. It's got to be the plans, bro. Honestly, didn't mind it. And I might, if you keep on, <laughs> I might be choosing that for my birthday fucking movie. Yes, let's do it. <laughs> Come on, bro. Um, so we get the usual... Um, Fam- brother- family dynamic, don't we, in the yeah. kitchen? Carly is the daughter, and she's got a little brother, Joshua. Typical um, four, four, fam- she, four kids family. She hates him. It, it's got a lot of Simpsons kitchen or sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and but then we've got their parents, who are Brent, is obviously Nicolas Cage, and Kendall, who is played by Selma Blair. Um, and, you know, the sister is about 15, 16, hates her mum and dad. They're trying their best to understand her. Nicolas Cage has kind of given up. He is just like, I've got to go out and do the do my job. Uh, I don't really give a fuck about what you guys are doing in the it, house. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we begin to find out. So I guess there's like different people that you could relate to watching this. I suppose you get to find out. I I don't relate to Nicholas Cage's character because I don't have his life that he has. But he's basically, as we see through flashbacks, we get to he's unhappy with the lifestyle that he has. He, he wants used to, to be, be driving around with titties in his face because yeah, this he is used a flashback. To be a party boy, doing yeah. donuts in a fast car. Uh, and he's got to wear a shirt and tie, do the same job every day, and he doesn't like it. There's a wonderful scene later, very late in the film, which we'll cover, where he talks about that, and he says... Because a lot of this film is... The, the clever thing is about this film is that, although it, it, on the premise is parents killing their kids, it's actually... they're doing They're potentially doing it because they're jealous... Because there's a lot of talk of being jealous of your kids. Like the two of the women later talk about, I'm really jealous. I caught my daughter naked the other day. I'm jealous of her, man. It's strange for the writer to come up with, uh, who is also the director, to come up with this idea. From like, Are they writing it from... Because like, they obviously write it from their parents being jealous of them. Maybe that's something that they but have I think, going I on. I think that is something that everybody... It, whether you're jealous or not, or you don't say it li- out loud, you well, are you envious that fact- your children have got youth yeah, and the I'm whole saying, lives ahead of them. You I'm know? saying he's probably, unless he is a lot of an older person, I don't know, I suppose he could be, and he, he's probably, but he's probably writing for his parents, being jealous of him. Yeah. I, uh, it, do you know what I mean? I'd imagine. 
Um, yeah, well, maybe he's he's jealous of his kids as well. You know, I my kids have got their whole lives ahead of them. I'm not like jealous, jealous, but I am envious that they. Oh, get to I do had, it no, no. From... When I I had that thought at one point as a dad when my kids came in, they're very very young. It's probably like Jay first time, and they're about two or whatever. And um, being like, um, um, oh my god, they've got like they've got a whole life ahead of them now, and I'm like this age, and do you know what I mean? You just yep. have that realization, <laughs> but it's ain't then then you do forget about it, yeah, whatever. But um, yes, I know what you're saying, but yeah, you do, and obviously you do get people whose children um, are successful, whatever, and they weren't. Uh, I just recently watched a Sylvester Stallone documentary, and his dad um, would just like be pretty violent with him and yeah. uh, just be a dick to him and always be, like, pissed off. And then later in life, he did, like, a polo tournament with his dad, like, horse, you know, polo. Yep. And um, his dad, like, smacked him real hard with the club, and after that, he gave up totally. And this was when he was an actual, already established actor, he did this. Yeah. And it's just that his dad was just like that, and it's just, like, some people are like that, and they're kind of jealous of their, their children. It's a bit like, why? Why are you not celebrating it? And I think that's maybe what this this virus or this whatever this thing is, is it brings that out to the most extreme level in these people. Um, yeah. But I would have preferred this movie, I think, to have a slower build up, I think, for this. But but you're right. Going back to what we were saying, there is, um, you know, Nicolas Cage does wish he was himself when he was younger. He and, <laughs> and where I was going with that very briefly is there's a scene, great scene towards the end, which we'll, we'll come back to properly when we get when we get there, where he talks about he says to his wife, I never thought I'd be this tired old fucker that I am. You know, everything aches. I've got no money. I'm losing my hair. You know, and I, I'm a, basically a slave to my kids. You know, if I go back in time and told me who was doing donuts with titties in my face, this is where I'd be. You know, this is just, just oh, how did I get here? You know, and he's so it, you're that's the whole like where his character is driven, really, in this, isn't it? It's, There's a bit in the kitchen, it's brilliant when he says, I, I was 17, and she, she's like, Oh, gross, you were 17. Yeah, he's like, Yeah, I was. <laughs> I was young obvious, once. obvious that he was 17 once. Obvious that every person who was past 17 was 17 once, but I love the fact she's like, Oh, gross, you were 17. I know, it's quite funny. Um. So, yeah, we, we established the dynamic. There's four of them. And we also establish, and put a little pin in this, is that later on, Nicholas Cage's grandparents are coming to visit. And he's like, oh, is that tonight? And she's like, yes, your mum and dad are coming over later. And that kind of gets forgotten until much later. Yeah, that's true. A fantastic yeah. little... Yeah. little uh, Lance Erickson. Little last minute. It's not a twist, because it is mentioned. But, it, yeah, Lance Henriksen turns up. And, obviously, when he sees his son... Ah, what do you think is going to happen there? It's great. Um, so, yeah, we talk about that. And they've also got a Chinese cook. Uh, uh, and, and, cleaner. and cleaner. And she actually has to say to her, I, I'm Chinese, not Vietnamese. Yeah. To the mum. They have to um, explain it to her. It's like, yeah, it's because well, like, it, it, yeah. her daughter is saying something about, Dad, uh, Grandpa always talks about the goddamn Vietnam. And he always talks about the Charlies. And she's like, don't say Charlie. Stabbing him or whatever, yeah. In yeah. front of, in front of yeah. our cleaner. And she's like, I'm st- don't worry, Charlie's Vietnamese. I'm Chinese. Um, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, and her daughter, yeah. and her the Chinese lady's daughter, Lisa, is there as well. She obviously hangs out there while she's doing her job at their house. So, they, you know, they're rich enough that they've got a cleaner slash um, cook who's there a lot of the time. That, and, and actually, Nicholas Cage does remind me of you for one scene especially. Because on the news, the mm-hmm. news is reporting that um, people seem to be killing their children. Like, well, there's been a few things around the, the US, and they talk about um, the train hitting the car, and and then you see Nicolas Cage and his son, and he grabs his son's car and train toys, and he smashes them together, and then he grabs the ketchup bottle, and he sprays it all over them, and goes, yeah, look at that! Whoa! <laughs> and his son's like, yeah, Dad! <laughs> and his wife's like... Jesus Christ, Brent, could you be a little bit more subtle? And But that is like you and Elijah, because I imagine you and Elijah pouring ketchup all over some toys and going, yeah, look at that. And I've seen you do similar things. So it, uh, there is that element. Uh, yeah, watching this film, actually, he, that kid is pretty much spot on with Elijah's size. I, I was getting a lot of Elijah vibes out of that kid. And when he's running around tickling himself, I was like, that's me and Elijah, that's me and Elijah anyway. So, yeah. it's quite fun. so I do relate to that, but I don't relate to Nicolas Cage's character in this Yeah. Thing. Other than that, you never drove around doing don't donuts have... with titties in your face. No, I didn't. I don't, I, no, I did do the donuts, but there was no titties. 
Did it, did it, did it. Um, so, yeah, lots of family tension. So we cut to mum dropping Carly off at school. And obviously she's trying to connect with her 15, 16-year-old daughter. Can you please stop Facebooking? I, I, I know. We I was all... watching this again going, I know why Rach picked this. Uh, <laughs> I, I've gone through exactly this, had this exact conversation. Yeah, she's trying to talk to her, but she's clearly obsessed with social media, the internet. And they do snap at each other a little bit. And she says, you know, I'd like it if we could be friends. And she, her daughter is so brutal. And it's true says, as well. Says, yeah. But she, but she says, look, mum, we were best friends. But then I became 13, 14. And then I got friends that are my best friends. And I don't need to hang out with my mum anymore. So you're now just my mum. Well, you're well, no longer said, my best friend. Just says, it's not it. my fault you've got no friends. Yeah. She says, she says, why don't you get some friends? It's not my fault you haven't got any friends. And it's like, whoa, your daughter is just completely... No, it is, it, she says, it's not my fault you have no life. Oh! And the mum's taken back by that a bit. Uh, I mean, the only, the only life she's got is going for um, afternoon brunch cocktails with her buddy. And that's really it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's bad. And, and, and again, though, this is a uh, thing that happens. You do get, and obviously you get the people like we have of the uh, next movie. Well, different reasons without supporting the next movie. Um, but it, the parents that don't want to give up their kids and don't want them to move out of home, want them to stay there forever. Norman Bates in the fruit cellar. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, fine, it's cool. 18? Crack on. Go enjoy the world and go do something. Don't hang out at home. <laughs> do it. <laughs> you know. Um, Carl, there's a great scene. The great teacher in this, Carly's teacher, she's in the class and one of her friends is listening to some music and the teacher takes the iPhone off of her and says, you know, what the hell do you think you're doing? This is my class. Give me that. It's confiscated till the end of the day. And then he gets a message from Carly saying, hey, sexy. And he replies to her again, why don't you bring your phone up to the front of the class too? So he's then, so he's a good teacher. He's confiscated both of their phones, um, says you can get these back at the end of the day. Um, and it's good because now they can sort of communicate with the world. It kind of is a little bit of a good plot plot point, really, um, but also a good teacher move, I feel, as well. Um, what does Nicolas Cage's kid find and put in a box in the car? What is it? Uh, a dead animal. But he's feeding it, though, isn't he? Yeah, he's feeding is something. Is it something that's dying rather than I, dead? Uh, yeah, I, I think, think it's a bird. To, I think it's a, maybe a baby bird and he's trying to nurse it back to health. So clinging on to his youth, Nicolas Cage has still got this badass Pontiac Firebird, which his he keeps. Tiddy Donut car. Yeah, he's got his Tiddy Donut Pontiac Firebird car in the garage, and he must polish that thing twice a week. It looks wonderful, but his son Joshua, bless him, is sneak sneaks into the garage and got inside it, and yeah, he's got. A, I think there's a dead animal in there, and there's some Cheerios and some cereal in there as well, like Lucky Charms or something. And Nicholas Cage is obviously very unhappy when he finds. He's like, God damn, it smells like it smells like what does he say? It smells like a dead animal in there or something like that. I don't know. He's he's very unhappy. Um, and he, Josh is going to be in a lot of trouble for doing that. But this establishes that Josh is a very curious boy who knows where things like car keys and potentially guns, which might come into play later on, are lying around the house. So he's like all boys his age, like your boy and like my boy will be, Gav. Very curious and I'll have to hide things in very high places if I don't want him to get to them, I should imagine. Oh, yeah. My, Daddy, my, what's it? Mine don't care now. They just care about their tablet, if the tablet's been charged or not. Daddy, what's this magazine? There won't be porn magazines in those in twenty years, will there? It, no. And why have you got porn mags in twenty I years? Haven't, time? I haven't got have any. You, yeah, but you you were saying twenty years you're gonna have porn mags. Well, you never know. They might come back in like into what, fashion. In style? What like vinyl? Like bags of porn in the woods. It's gonna be like Facebook me posts. You, of like you, oh, porn, si porn in woods comes back in style. Me and you'll be sixty-five, going for a little walk through the woods. To go, oh, remember back. At Hang on a minute, what's this over here? And you'll be like, <laughs> Put no, it with your walking it's stick. It's a bag of pornos! You pick it up, I can't be your perts. My, my PP doesn't even work anymore. Oh, I've, I've, uh, I haven't seen oh, mine for ten years. I can feel the flutter. Turn the page. The flutter. 
<laughs> just two sad old men trying to get hard ons in the woods. That'll be a honestly. Kids nowadays don't understand the, <laughs> the joy of going to the woods and going. What's in that plastic bag? That black bin bag? Going. Oh my god! It's women with boobs. You know, what it's I, like what it I love blew my mind. It. What I love about podcasting with you is we always have tangents. We always will. But whenever we have a patron's pick, I always think somebody out there, in this case, Rachel, is listening to us thinking, I've orchestrated this conversation by picking mum and dad. And this is where their brains are going. This is oh, great. Home. She's a puppet master. And we're just the puppets. Two old men in the woods. But it was though, the you know, kids aren't the kids aren't really get to appreciate that anymore. Like that whole experience of you of your mates, and it wasn't like a, a weird thing. You weren't standing around having a wank or something. It was like you were there all just as this unison. Like, like it's like like Stand by Me or something. Like a Stephen King story. You're like, oh my god, and you're all the, all open magazine going, oh my god. Like I remember the first time seeing any of that stuff and going, what the hell is that? It was a dildo. But I was like, what is that? What, I know it's wrong because there's loads of them on this page near for sale. But what is it? What what goes on with that? And there's all these different objects and shapes and sizes. And I, and I remember it clearly. What does that do? <clears throat> and I had no idea, no idea what anything did and it went. Now I know everything. Okay. Nicholas Cage talks about anal beads in this film, doesn't he? As well. He does. Yeah, we'll come to that. Um, so, Joshua, whilst Joshua is fucking around with the car, we do get just a little snippet, a shadow of, of the Chinese lady cleaner using a meat pallet. What do you call those mallets? Like you use pulverizer, meat tenderizing hammer on her child. It, we, but you, don't see, you just see, don't see my it, shadow. We don't see it early on, uh, later. <sighs> Yet. It's uh, off camera. She's on the phone yeah, taking conversations. Very, very quick. Just before that, when that kid is feeding this bird or whatever, the music is a, a really intense, very loud orchestral piece, and it's like like a proper orchestra. Like da da da, and it's just like, what is going on? It's like, oh my god, it's such a weird. And it's like those are the bits in here which we don't sort of mention because we're just talking about it. We you, we can't appreciate until you actually watch it. But those bits are like, what the hell? So if you do watch this again from the R oh, review and you fancy it, check out the music and how it's used. It was just and so like, it, what the because hell? Because it cuts it cuts from that music to suddenly women doing aerobics. To and it, it oh, I think I'm in an 80s pop vid, music video. It's great. Selma Blair. Like a synth music. And a real, like, comical kind of, like, uh, carry-on style humour. Titillating humour. And it's like, and that, where's this come from? And it's these two women, like, one of them, obviously, Selma Blair and her best friend. And they're, basically, they fancy their aerobics instructor. If this film had been made in the 80s, I'd have said this had cocaine all over it. Especially with Nicolas Cage in it. Just because just it's one scene to the next. It's like, what is going on, you know? Um, so it cuts to brunch and um, Selma Blair and her friend are having brunch and, and cocktails, I think. And they're sort of talking about how much they hate their kids, they're jealous of their kids. And, and they're also uh, talking about whether or not they can fuck the aerobics instructor. Because her, well, her friend is. Selma's just kind of going along with going, uh, OK, yeah. But her friend's just like, oh, you've got to keep hot, though. Or your husband would be going off like trying to uh, f- fuck a 17-year-old. And it's a bit like... Really? 17 year old? Is that just sounds yeah, disgusting. Think, they're just like, being extreme, aren't they? I guess forget, so. This, this is director of Crank, don't forget. Um, but when it comes to paying for brunch, Salma, mummy, notices... 100 oh, bucks. I did have a $100 bill in here earlier, and obviously we know that uh, Carly took this money. Did you ever steal it off your yeah. parents? Yes. Yes. Um, but I told my dad about it recently actually oh, really? uh, um, and it wasn't very yeah. much i probably stole the sum total of about 20 quid over the course of about two years because my dad was a milkman um yeah, and he always had about 500 quid in change and notes in his big leather satchel that was hanging up in the cupboard under the stairs and i twigged oh I can take a pound coin out of this. And I took a pound coin once and bought loads of stickers because in the 80s, a pound coin you could get loads with it. And then I did that again. And then I did it again. And I never took more than about a pound or two at a time. And this was over the course of like 18 months, two years. <laughs> that was it. And then I told him 
Uh, about four or five years ago, we were having a heart to heart. I think not long after we lost my mum, actually. And we were sort of sitting there chatting, and I said, Oh, Dad, I stole money off you once. And he laughed and he went, Oh, yeah, how much? And I think he was thinking, Fucking hell, how much are you taking? And I went, About 20 quid. And he laughed his ass up. He said, Oh, God, okay. Let's, don't, I wouldn't worry about that. He said, I, I had a feeling you might have twigged that you could take the odd pound coin out of my bag, but I'm not worried about it. Yeah, it was my, like I took a thousand pounds off him. <laughs> yeah, no, and my dad had money in his drawer next to his bed, and I used to just take bits. And he, he one day said to me, "Can you stop stealing my money for cigarette for cigarettes?" Because I was I was nicking them for cigarettes. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I think I think I'll know. I'm I'll know if Jack needed to do. That. I think all kids push boundaries. So yeah, it, it is what it is. But um, we're going off all tangents here, Rachel. Thank you. This is a. Uh, good so far um confession parents, time i can join in as well because I'm, I'm a dad now of two and a half yeah, well, years this con- this is bringing up all these conversations because we we <laughs> actually can live both of these yeah um so yes yeah, so she notices her money's missing she can't pay and she says oh your daughter's probably stealing from you mine does she steals from me all the time and sam blair's thinking is she stealing from me god i thought i knew my daughter she really me and her already drifted far far apart cut back to school and the teacher gets a phone call. Yeah. Oh, uh, Johnny, you need to go to the office. Another phone call. Oh, you need to go to the office. Another phone call. What is going on? Carly, you need to go to the office. And slowly, everyone's been called to the office. And everyone's parents have gathered and crowding around the outside of the school gates, aren't they? Like the 28 days later, sort of. Well, well they're confused because the, the t- these teachers are like, Bing! and it's like, oh, what now? And like, and like, the student's got to go up to the, go, Donnie, go fucking up to the head office. Oh, Frankie, you go too. And then all of a sudden there's cops coming, turning up outside. So the kids are looking out the window going, what the fuck is going on? Um, and obviously, I think everyone is that audience as well. It's, it's that happening. classic... That classic whisper of something about to happen, isn't it? Where, like, oh, a police car in the distance. Oh, the strange yeah. things so, are happening. So this straight away, though, this made me go, like, right, because we know what the premise is. Everybody is, is going in to watch the movie, um, I would imagine, unless you're going in completely blind, I doubt it. Um, so at this point here, my thoughts were, okay, so this must be happening already in other places. Mm. Um, but I suppose we did have that news report, so I guess that did kind of cement that. Because the cops are now turning up as a pre, uh, just in case the well, they're, well, they're expecting like riot. Um, the parents to fucking go for the kids, but it's quite funny because the the cops must be like, we've got nothing to worry about. They're not going to try and attack us. We've just got to stop them getting to their kids. Yeah, they're um, just a bit so, concerned as to why they're crowding so much as well, aren't is, they? They're, is like, this, this is a bit weird. So they're obviously establishing it when it's end of school time. So someone up up in an office has thought about it and said, right, we need to get people, cops, over to all the schools. So do you reckon this is happening all the schools around? Yes, because uh, the news reports indicate that it's, there's been lots of attacks um, all over the US and I should imagine if this is a global scale then everywhere it's happening as well yeah. but it's, okay. it's a slow slow build up slow build up so far we find out more news reports in a moment I think um, we also find out that Carly's boyfriend Damon he's got an exam he's, he's doing it yeah he's just finishing up an exam and he's nailed it he's finished she says oh you've got 20 minutes left and he's like yeah but I've done it like he just knows he's smashed the exam yeah, he's, he's done really well yeah, yeah. but um, so he goes outside but his parents um, aren't there for him he's got a push bike and he can just cycle home himself so he well, opens the door all the parents are crowding to get in what the but... hell and he goes past them and as he opens the door he doesn't really think about it he just goes and padlocks his bike in the in uh, in the back he's in the foreground in the background all the parents just use that moment of the door being open and all just go in but then we don't know because he just cycles off yeah and well, then well we, we do know but well that we yeah, because <laughs> then we get our real crazy chaos scene of slow motion parents climbing the fence and attacking their children whilst we get a pop a, an upbeat pop song playing um and it is it is all it's game on really um the alarm goes off to kick things off and the police to start arresting parents but then the parents start fighting back like i said fences get cl- get climbed um some parents push their children down on the ground uh they're strangling them one of them stabs their child with a uh 
a key or a cop with a key the cops are getting stabbed as well because they'll just go through you if, if you if you're in front of their child they need to go and kill their child they will just go through you again and it's, the, sorry no go on i was gonna say again with the juxtaposition of this scene of all the carnage happening uh, there's pleasant jazz lo- uh, lift yeah. lift jazz it's, it's it if in your lift car it's the jazz that you would listen to going dun, 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 dun. and it's it just going okay it's nice and the, the visuals are 28 days later like fully on, rage on because yeah. because they're it's like we said earlier they're not you're not like it all the time only when your children are in front of you because their yeah, children are there they're chasing them down. Yeah, yeah. damon gets home and um, he's still unaware yeah he's like well that, and what was going on back at the school there? His dad attacks him, and he's still unaware, because back in the day, as we assume, and that's why his dad's not there to collect him, because he has to do it himself, his dad doesn't really give a shit. His dad's drunk. And his dad used to abuse him, because he says, not again, Dad, which is kind of deep. Yeah, so, it is. He says, not not again, Dad, and then his dad really picks up good, the bottle. It's a really good uh, thought, and when this idea was concept was come, I came up with, it's a really good idea. Uh, horrific when, actually, we could sort of go there. It, I presume it might come from some experience. Um, but It's good writing, Gab. It's what's that slightly... is pretty good. Uh, and, and I'll take it back. I said it's, uh, I'd rather it's to slow down. It isn't getting there straight away. Yeah, um, I think they've, I just, they've got time. There, there's time for them to add these little elements in. I it's only I'm an hour upset. and twenty-five minutes. I think I'm just upset when we get to. To be honest, though, when we get into the house, it kind yeah. of just goes. Uh, now we're in a house. Yeah, because the film, the like I just mentioned, it's only an hour and twenty-five minutes, but it does. It the does third act. Spoiler drag. alert: Me and Gav feel the third act outstays its welcome a little Which bit. Is it shouldn't do, but there's no sort of real a build up to an ending here. But all of this stuff happening in That's the real world and outside world is very interesting and very exciting. I wonder if they did have originally in the story uh, an ending, and then you know uh, just couldn't do it because of days cut or money cut, and just couldn't film it. Well, well, Damon says, like you said, not again, Dad. Then his dad picks up a bottle of booze and he says, oh, Dad, I think you probably had enough of that. Then his dad breaks the bottle and comes at him with the broken bottle, which is obviously more than just beating your kid. You're trying to cut your kid open with a bottle here. He cuts Damon's arm and da- and then he falls and lands on the bottle, doesn't he? And his well, dad's his dead. <clears throat> right yeah. on his throat. Um, well, that's his dad still bad. tries to go for him while he's got a slit throat. It, it's literally like proper like a zombie. rage, yeah. yeah. And it's the TV signal. Um, we cut back to Mama Kendall. She's having some uh, sort of flashback with a guy. Yeah, she was is when she was rejected from a job. And this, this again, is Nicholas Cage's uh, having like his flashback to titties and donuts. This is her flashback to this guy that she kind of likes as well. Yeah, yeah. But she. Uh, the subplot for her is that her sister is about to become a mum. So her sister is going to be going into labour sometime today. And she gets a phone call while she's in the car crying from her flashback to say, oh, your sister's just gone in to have her baby. Can you come on in? So she's like, well, I better get get to the hospital then. So off she goes. Cut back to her daughter Carly and her friend Riley. And they, because school's been closed for the day, they they get back to Riley's mum's house. And they've already been in the toilets discussing uh, pills and vaping. and Yeah, they do all the naughty things. Basically being, being my middle child before she was pulled out of school. And so they sit, they sit around and they sort of, oh, let's get some booze. Come on, we've got no school today. This is great. Um, then they on the TV, they see national reports yeah well one of them does because the other one goes upstairs um where they find out their mummies yeah riley goes upstairs so carly's downstairs watching the tv and she realizes children all over the u.s are being killed by their parents what on earth is going on meanwhile like you said riley goes upstairs and that's all we see until carly goes looking for her and she finds riley's mum strangling riley with some underwear and she looks up in the middle of in the middle of strangling and says, "Hi, Carly. How are you?" Or something like something like that. Like she doesn't even notice that she's doing it because it's just built into her to kill her child. It's so brutal. And that's that bit. We're back at the hospital, and we are. Uh, basically, we have a scene where a woman gives 
birth to the baby and then and then just obviously wants to kill the baby and yeah. the music playing along to this juxtaposition is it must have been must have love, been love by Roxette. i mean the, the lyrics say it all um <clears throat> Now, this is another reason why I was glad I didn't watch this with my wife, because, yeah, this scene could be triggering. You know, she's just had a baby and because she's got this disease, this biological weapon, which they think it is, she starts squeezing the baby really tightly and they have to fight her off. The police are called, security guards are called. Kendall takes the baby as the as the ante and they're like, no, 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 even though you're an ante, we still can't trust you. We have to take the baby away. So she ends up giving the baby to the, the cops then we see this scene. All the dads looking at the incubators. So we got all like you've seen the shot a load of times. Twenty incubators with a baby, one in each. One's got a baby in each one, and then there's twenty dads to that side, and they're all just looking, almost basically looking at a buffet. Like, yep, we're going to go and kill our babies in a minute. This is great. And I'm wondering why they're not. I'm wondering is it because they don't know which one's theirs yet? They're all kind of waiting to go in the room, aren't they? They're all just looking. But that is a pretty fucking horrible. See, no fucks are given scene. for this, like, especially at the beginning. But you get out for that woman leaving the baby in the car and getting out straight away. It's like no fucks are given, you know. We're, we're putting across that everyone dies of children, regardless of age. Yeah. Well, um, Carly runs outside because obviously she's just seen Riley get killed, her best friend get killed, and she bumps into a man with a bloody baseball bat who clearly is just beating his son or daughter to death. And she's scared of him, but then Damon turns up and he says, well, it's okay, it's okay. He won't hurt us because we're not his children. He's worked it out. Clever kid, Damon. He's worked it out and he's seen the news reports. We're only in danger if it's our parents. Anyone else isn't going to harm us. But obviously he's got quite a cut arm from where his dad tried to cut him with the bottle. So he's got a little injury, but they're, um, they team up. So they're back together again now, which is good. Um, he says to her, where's your brother? Uh, he's at home right we need to go and get him and we need to get him right now so they go back to their house to get little joshua who's waiting around at home uh cut to nicholas cage he hasn't been in the film for a while has he no actually i get no i haven't thought about it but no and he wakes up because he's so bored at his job he's fallen asleep at his desk and he wakes up oh oh <laughs> oh and he, he, he's obviously heard this static sound because he sits up, looks at a photo of his kids and then the, the sound drops out of the movie and we just see him scream his lungs out in rage at this picture of his children. But there's no sound. So like it's quite effective. Um, we all know what Nicolas Cage sounds like when he screams. He does it in almost every film. So we didn't need to hear it. I think it worked quite nicely. Um, Kendall... Oh, Kendall gets home. Well, she calls her cleaner on the phone, Chinese cleaner, and she says... She says it's all fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's... She said, it's Joshua. Yes, he's here. Don't worry. He's he's hiding somewhere around here. She's like, okay, well, I'll be home in a minute to see him, meaning to kill him. She's like, yeah, that's absolutely fine. What we realise is she's mopping up all of her daughter's blood, her daughter Lisa, that she killed earlier with the mallet. So they're killing, they're killing their kids left, right and centre in this movie, aren't they? Yeah. Blood everywhere. Carly and Damon plan to get in the house, get Joshua, leave and get out. But this, the cleaner is being weird. She's acting strange, even though she's not going to kill them. She's just acting. She's like, I'll clean up this mess and then I'll then I'll leave. But I'm not going to leave. She's till struggling I'm... now to get up because of blood, you know, it's quite yeah. a pop up. Do you want a sandwich? She keeps saying things like that to them. Like, Very passive no, aggressive. Just, isn't just, it? just get out, please. Are you hungry? Oh, all right. No. Nicholas Gage gets home. There is nothing worse than meeting your girlfriend's dad for the first time, or, or one of the first times, and he doesn't approve of you very much. And Nicholas Cage I've gets got, home. I've got, I know that stuff's coming soon, I tell you. He says, what do you want? What are you doing here? To uh, Damon. Damon's like, well, it's not what it looks like, uh, sir. Uh, I'm Carly's boyfriend, Damon. He's like, yeah, I know that. I know all about hormones. I was a 17-year-old boy, too. Uh, I didn't have access to things that you have got now. And he starts talking about, you guys have got access to ass to mouth, ass to ass, anal beads. I didn't even know what anal beads were. And he just 
gives this massive speech all about porn and anal bees and ass to ass. I don't even know, Gav, I don't even know what ass to ass is. But Nicolas Cage talks about it in this film. Uh, I can only imagine what it is. Ass to ass is a, a end of a Requiem for a Dream. Oh, of course it is. God, yes, Jesus, that was a scene, come, isn't it? Come on. Come get your, on. Get your perv on, come on. I forgot about that. That's to be um, my T-shirt motto, get your perv on. Get your perv on, let your freak frag fly. Um, <laughs> but he's quite, like, although he's talking about all this crazy stuff to Damon, he's just would be doing that anyway, I think, because he's a protective dad. But then he sees his daughter... And he just launches at her, doesn't he? He just flies at his kids immediately. Yeah. Knocks Damon out. And um, Joshua and Carly run into the basement. Um, and the basement is trashed. And we get this weird, like, a oh, great flashback, but a weird place to put it, really. Um, where all of a sudden the film stops and we're treated to this flashback of Nicolas Cage having a midlife crisis. He's bought a pool table, a snooker table, to build in his what he calls his man cave in the basement but his wife catches him asks him how much he spent they argue about it why do you need a man cave he's like i need some separation from my kids you know i'm always stepping over toys stepping on toys i just want my own space and then he grabs a mallet and he trashes the pool table he's basically having a midlife crisis absolutely just goes nuts he he has a big old rant about aging i didn't expect to be this tired old fucker you know and all this kind of stuff that goes on and it's just like what a strange place to have a flashback uh fascinating right here where uh it jumps to her and she explains her side of life and and for me as a man i i you know and I found it very interesting, actually, and insightful, where um, she was saying, like, you know as a woman that, regardless, a time's going to come where you're possibly, you know, quite probably, going to d- grow a child in you. And that hmm. thought's always there at some point, and a scary thought, an incredible thought. I never really thought that. Never really put that in my mind. But even as a child, that, that thought in a woman is always there, potentially. Not for everybody. But... Yeah. but 85 percent is and i found that really fascinating yeah i agree with you it's it's it, again it's very male. intelligent writing because you're seeing both sides here you're seeing you know men but men want to be young virile strong youthful boys all their lives but they grow old and they well, grow up and women always know that they just most women want to have a baby but mm-hmm. they don't realize that that is going to partially destroy their body in some ways it's going to heavily age them they're going to then age anyway and if they leave it too late they might not be able to have that baby so there are all these pressures that we put on ourselves in society whether you're a man or a woman you have these pressures on you and we neither of us probably see the side of it but i agree with you fully very clever scene that opens both sides up really yeah well she sort of explains where you know you you potentially might not have a career because you end up being a parent and that sort of thing and uh it was really interesting to that i presume that the writer uh brian taylor i presume he's he's dropping in a lot of life experiences going on here yeah i imagine i imagine these conversations he's had you know. It's interesting stuff, man. Very interesting stuff. Well, um, we cut away from the flashback and we cut to Selma Blair, um, Kendall. She's driving home, eager to kill her children. On the radio, it does say, you know, more and more attacks are happening. We must say, even though it is in your gut instinct to protect your children, whatever you do, do not go near your children at this time. Please do not go near your children. Well, obviously, she's going to go to her children because she thinks, well, the world's falling apart. I've got to go and see them. That's the uh, that's the uh, uh, the bad like, you know, cycle of events going on here. Yeah. You can't get out of it. So she... She talks she them comes, through the door, doesn't she? Because they're locked in the cupboard. Well, she, she finds Nicolas Cage unconscious because he, he got knocked out. <gasps> He's like, whoa, you're home early? She's like, you're home early too. And he says to her, they're in the basement. So they run down. Yeah, you're right. They talk to them through the door. It's a good little scene, you know, with the door in the middle of the screen separating them. Um, and she's really trying to talk to them, you know, and I like, come on, kids. I'm not going to hurt you. Daddy's not going to hurt you. Just come on out. Come out. And she's almost winning them over. And just as she's sort of, 
trying her best. Suddenly, Cage just goes, Your motherfucking mother is telling you to fucking come out here, you little motherfuckers. And he just, it's like you've lost them now, Nick. Then, they then were he all, goes, Motherfuckers, you can open this door. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, I'm done with this. I'm going to go get my tools. So Selma grabs the power tools. Yeah, they get jigsaw says, and stuff. She says, this is a sawzall. It's, it's, it's called a sawzall because it saws all. Uh, so she, ca- she sort of starts store, store it. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible attempt, really. It, it reminded me of those awful, awful electric saws you'd have in the 80s trying to cut your roast beef on a Sunday. Do you remember them? Yeah. The ones or, in the corner. Everyone is like fashionable to have it. But like, <laughs> my, my mum and dad had a bread, an electric bread knife. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it didn't really cut fuck no, all. It, would, it, it wouldn't gimmicks. even cut the butter. Uh, everyone in the 80s had one. Or like the and my dad would stand there in the opener. kitchen. My dad would stand there in the kitchen going... Just using I'd like be looking a knife. at him thinking... Nothing's happening, Dad, is it? That bread is not getting cut. But the dads wouldn't have it because they were the ones that went out and said, Oh, look, Marjorie, I brought this gadget home. It'd be great to use. And no one can say a word against it. We had all of them, Gav. We had uh, an ice cream maker. Remember the electric tin openers? Yeah, we had one of them. We had an ice cream maker that we used like twice and it got left on top of the kitchen cupboard for about 20 years covered in dust. They bought every gadget that would come out. In yeah. the 80s, my mum and dad were like, oh, but, yeah, we'll get get an ice cream maker. We'll make ice cream every week. But get the electric twice. saw one, though, the big big sort of beige plastic body with yeah. a little sword. They use that in the um, in the new, uh, well, not the new, in the 2018 Evil Dead movie. She uses that, doesn't she? That's true. It's a really, uh, it's really crappy uh, choice to get her uh, own hand Amer- off of it. American listeners, please tell us, and Canadian listeners, uh, you know, tell us, please, uh, is this something you've got going on still? Because uh, in England, and uh, that, that went out but it was a thing it was a thing for sure um, so yeah uh, anyway Cage goes upstairs to get his gun but and he looks and goes, oh my god no gun and then he hears shots mm. uh, perfect timing go downstairs uh, mum's been shot Joshua's totally... shot mum through the door what is it is she not... where is she shot oh? in the shoulder in the shoulder just uh, in the shoulder could be bad not, if it hit a vital bit but it's not too bad yet She's like, why have you got a gun? He's like, I bought her for home security, for protection. Is, uh, yeah, and unfortunately, it's a thing which happens, isn't yeah. it? When people buy their guns for protection and uh, the, the kids get them. Because there's a, there's a shot, a clip later on, of the, that actually then goes to the kid, a little montage of him in his pants. Doing going, Robert De Niro. Yeah, whoa, <laughs> with a gun looking in the mirror and stuff. And it's just like, yeah. how many times is this happening? Kids shoot themselves, you know. He said, yeah. he said, "What what password did you put there? What's... I put I put put the uh, son's uh, Josh whatever. I put Josh's date of birth. So Josh is there going great. Says so my date of birth, brilliant. What this film um, manages to do quite cleverly at this point now is we everything's a bit like a cartoon at this point, but because because we're looking at it like a bit of a cartoon and everything's a little bit crazy, they can sneak some good messages in." like the gun stuff, like the women's side and the men's side of growing old. All these little little messages are in there if you look. But on the surface, it looks like a crazy, stupid Nicolas Cage, you know, almost slasher. But actually, there are some good, there is some good stuff built into it as well, which, which again, on a second or a third viewing, you'll be like, oh, okay, pretty cool, pretty cool. Right. Um, yeah, the gun stuff definitely is, is good that they snuck that in there. Yeah, but I think Cage's uh, unhappiness and his his thing is just his character arc rather than something that she sneaks in because that's just uh, carries on through the whole film. But yeah, ha- popping the gun thing in there. Is he, quite, he, he bandaged up his wife. It's almost comical, unfortunately, seeing the kid jump yeah. running around his pants with a gun. Um, he bandages up his wife. Um, they Carly... start rigging up some gas pipe in, don't they? Yeah, well, you know, Carly and Josh are still in the basement. They're wondering, well, how are we going to get out of this? So the parents yeah. cut the gas mains, hook up a hose pipe, wheel it around the side of the house, and tuck it through the um, basement window. So basically, they're going to gas their kids. Um, and while she's doing that, mum notices the chopped up Chinese girl's body in the bin she goes back in and she says right that's all hooked up um, oh, 
Lisa's in the bin. Oh, that's a mess we'll have to clean up. Honestly, she's a cleaner. You'd think she'd clean up her own mess. And he's like, oh, I've always said she's not good. And then he says, any minute now, we're going to hear him coughing. <laughs> and they're like laughing about the fact that their kids are going to get gassed in um, this basement. Unfortunately, their kids are like MacGyver. Their kids are like MacGyver because they hook up some matches to the bottom of the door. Oh, well, they wake up, but actually, very quickly, just when they sort of turn out, it, and the mum's at the door, just looking at the door, it's a real close up shot, kind of in the same style as um, a sideways shot of looking at Jack Nicholson and the shining looking at the door, real close up to the face. There's a sound of like an aeroplane coming down. It's a drone's sound, which goes on for about 25 seconds, which is quite a substantial lot when you watch the movie. Again, the sound is on and the idea. But I don't know what it's meaning, but I quite enjoyed it. I actually we ran it back to listen to it again. But it's the sound of like an aeroplane going, ooh, you know, going down and down and down and down. And it's an for in- a while. There's an interesting shot as well where just as they're about to start the gas, they the bullet holes in the door and where she's tried to cut it, they, she puts masking tape over the... Yeah. Um, and then the daughter looks through... Puts her, puts her finger for it, and she almost stabs her finger. Yeah, yeah, so that's a really good... You know, it reminds you that these aren't... They're not your parents anymore, but, whatever these things are. But the MacGyver children are going to uh, st- uh, uh, tape down to book of matches down to the uh, door and a striker on the, the uh, other side of the door. So basically, when the door opens, it's going to strike matches. Yeah, and it, bl- it boom, it blows uh, Nicolas Cage and Selma Blair flying through the, the house. Yeah. Kendall wakes up. Um, she grabs the pulverizing mallet. She chases Charlie. They sort of fight. Um, Damon wakes up. Let's not forget Carly's boyfriend, Damon's there. He wakes up and he helps um, Carly fight her mum. They end up locking mum in the cupboard in the bedroom. Um, and... Joshua comes in and he's like, where's mom? And she's in the cupboard, but she's got a coat hanger, Gav. Yeah, oh. a bit Michael Myers like. Be- yeah, she bends it around and it cuts right through, like a fish, through the, uh, with a hook, through um, poor old Damon. He get, he's he been getting knocked out, cut with glass bottles, then he gets a coat hanger through his mouth. This guy must really love Carly. Um, he's really doing everything he can to look after her. Um and it's a really, really good stunt now because he gets knocked downstairs and it's a real stunt. It's not CGI, you know, it's a stunt man getting knocked over the banister and we see him land on the sofa and then on the floor. Um, and it looks great. Really good stunt. And this is where Cage gets the saws all because it saws. Oh! And he, he's going after his kids. They corner their children in the kitchen. Bing bong. Yep, this is great. This is great writing. It's a great little something that was set up earlier. They're just about to kill their children. The children are crying, you know, please, please don't do this. And like you said, Gav, ding dong. And what is it? Uh, it's mum it? and dad. Nicholas Cage's parents are here. And so he's Lance just like, Henriksen. oh, God, I'll get rid of them. No worries. And he's on his door. All right, mum and dad. Doesn't think anything of it. And even just the audience until his dad and mum, uh, mum maces him, and his dad tries to start stabbing him up. Yeah, he gets a pepper spray straight to the face. And his dad, who's the Vietnam War vet, let's not forget. Starts going for him. He just starts stabbing him like something from a guy. And Ritchie then you go, movie. oh, yeah, mum and dad. And they work like a team, don't they? Because like you say, she pepper sprays him. And then Dad comes straight oh, in. Oh, it's like they've been outside going, what should we do when we get there? You pepper spray and oh, I'll start standing yeah. him. It's like parents, my my parents would have back in the day knocked on the door and been like, oh, I'll give Daniel the flowers and if you give him the cake. But this time they're like, I'll do the pepper spraying and then you stab him up. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the parents enter the fray and we just get a lot of chasing now. There is... This bit does go on for a bit, but the bit, the bit I really, really like is the three generations. You've got Joshua, who's probably eight or nine, being chased all around the house by a crazy Nicolas Cage, whilst he is also being chased around the house by a crazy Lance Henriksen. And it's just this funny three-generational chase thing that's going on all around the house. Um, it's really silly, and we get some flashbacks um, of Nicolas Cage being a good dad and, you know, talking about the Pontiac Firebird uh, and how he trashed his dad's car and he had to 
rebuild it with his own money. His dad made him do that. Um, and meanwhile, Nicolas Cage's mum isn't attacking um, Kendall because she's not her mum, but she does sort of call her a slut and a bitch mm. and say, you know, you were never getting any good for my son and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, the fight breaks outside. Nicolas Cage uses the Pontiac Firebird to run over his mum and dad. He pretty much kills um, his mum and dad. Yeah. Damon is still alive somehow, and he knocks out Kendall with a shovel. Um, Cage and Blair, wait, mum and dad, wake up, tied up in the basement, and they sort of sit there and go, let us go, kids, come on, let us go. And the kids say, yeah, we, we love you, mum and dad, but we're not going to let it go. We really, really love you. And the last line is cut off, actually. He says, we really love you, too. But sometimes we just want to. And that's the end. We just want to kill you. Uh, and, yeah, I guess it's a frustrated uh, dad wrote this then. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I don't like the ending. There's no ending. It's a bit like... I know what you mean. It does kind of like, come out of nowhere. You'd like to see some... I don't care usually, but I do sometimes I like, like a conclusion. I'd like to have gone the house or something. It was like yeah. going to the house, win the house, and that's it. Like, nah. Okay, it doesn't I like, make me want like to watch a, it again, really. That's I like problem. a conclusion. I do like a conclusion. Yeah, I, I, I don't mind open-ended films, but this needed something. It's like, it was. It stinks of, I've got a great idea. Great. Have you got an ending? No. Oh, well, don't worry about it. Okay. But because he made a bit of money with the Crank movies and that Ghost Rider movie was is awful, but also it's a bit of a cult movie now. He's a bit of an extreme director throw Nicolas Cage in the mix this is probably his best film I would say I, I, I enjoyed the first crank but this is his best film oh, um, really? first time I watched it uh, and I'll hold my hands up I really enjoyed it second time I watched it I really didn't like it this is the third time I've watched it and I got a lot more out of it this time around because I'm doing it as a reviewer um, it, it gets like a 6 6.5 out of 10 from me I do enjoy it, and I would I would watch it again in a few years if it's on like the horror channel or just happens to be on somewhere. I'd watch it again. I won't go out of my way to watch it, but I always enjoy Nicolas Cage. Selma Blair is quite hot as well. Um, Gav, this is your second time watching it. Thoughts? Oh, I've said my thoughts. You said them. Yeah. So it's got its flaws, but because it's only an hour and 25 minutes, although it feels like it outstays its welcome, it does get from A to B and get the job done, really, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, it's all right. Uh, do I give it a thumbs up or thumbs down? I don't give it a thumbs up. I think there's I'll some give it good stylish up. points to it and stuff, but uh, I'm not probably ever going to watch it again. Well, most importantly, let's hear what Rachel says about it. She says, Mum and Dad... I can't believe this movie came out in 2018. I've only just found out about it now. It's a black comedy, and who better to be the dad, or she writes, the da, because she's Irish, the da, the Nicolas Cage, and Salma Blair was great as well. She has MS, I mentioned this earlier, which is a fucker of a disease that is close to my heart. Mm. She would have went public with her diagnosis shortly after the release of this film, so she gets a massive round of applause from me. What's, what an exciting storyline. There's many, many good scenes. When Cage answers the door to his grandparents, uh, the souls all, and this is a really great idea, honey. All good, crazy, maniacal laughs. And no matter how funny it got, there were scenes that brought you back to the absolute horror of this situation. We said that. There were times where this movie doesn't hold back. Um, she said the scene in the hospital with his sister who'd just given birth is one of those very moments and the parents pacing the fence line then going into 28 days later mode when they go over the railings very very scary yeah um, so that's all I'll read of her message for now okay she enjoyed it that's why she's chosen it and thank you I'm glad, always a pleasure to talk Nicolas Cage Rachel um, and this is a film that Gav watched recently you know and yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Cage, Cage Rage. Well, it's always good to the Nicolas Cage one. But yeah, uh, thanks for that, uh, Rachel. Um, surely, surely Nicolas Cage must be one of our most um, like reviewed actors on our show. We've probably done 
seven, eight, nine, ten Cage movies now. It probably is. I mean, he's the unofficial mascot of the Haunted Hill. We know that. Yeah, you know? I, I would imagine he is. I couldn't think of anyone else who would be. Well, there is only one other person that might be, and that, that person has just entered the room, and that person is Mr. Bill Murray, who is here to lead us into the world of the strange. Aren't you, Bill? He's all ready. What have you got on today, Bill? What's this? I don't understand. Oh, you've come as a character from Pulp Fiction. Okay. Yeah, well, I can see it's the gimp. Gav, what, what do you think about this gimp, Bill Murray gimp outfit? I don't understand why. Yeah, okay. Well, the gimp isn't sleeping, Bill. Uh, can you please lead us into the world of the strange? Why, Bill? Why? Why do this? <laughs> Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. World of the Strange World. It's a strange. I got a couple of stories. Stories. You love a story, don't you? Uh, Jack and Ori. Yes. Jack, you know, what's the story, Morning Glory? I've got stories about skeletons. I've got stories about Halloween, time travel, okay. uh, and snakes. Snakes. Let's start with Halloween. Okay. Uh, we're talking about a, a Florida, so bear in mind Florida, a charity shop in Florida, put up a Halloween display of stuff that they were selling but also, you know what it's like in a charity shop they always put the stuff up when it's seasonal because they hope well people will come in and buy their Halloween stuff so an anthropologist made a haunting discovery after he found a real human skull on display in a charity shop in Florida nice uh, police were alerted after the customer suspected that the head smiling at them with decorations all over it was more than just a decoration this uh, shopper happened to be an anthropologist who is someone who identifies who specialises in the scientific study of humans I thought you said, uh, it, I thought it says gender identifier then it happens to be identifier as well as that matter <laughs> <laughs> uh, which means they were able to tell the difference immediately that this was a real skull not an artificial skull okay. the owner of the store said that the skull was found in a storage unit years ago and they put it out well, every it Halloween fucking science of the lambs he puts that out every Halloween no one ever buys it, but we put it out because it sort of attracts people to come in for Halloween. A, a, a real skull? Okay. Yeah, a real skull. Um, the office, the sheriff's office said, in a twist of not-so-funny events, the uh, Lee County Sheriff's Office uh, were notified of a skull in a charity shop in North Fort Myers. Based upon the observation, observations of the detectives of the scene, the skull is indeed that of a human. It has been confiscated to carry out further tests. They don't believe this is suspicious in any way. However, they won't be displaying skulls anymore. So there we go. Quite Just a little on. Halloween overspill from last month for you. Uh, Dave, who uh, is my mate, who, if frequent, funny enough, does my tattoos in his tarot pile, has got a real off skull. Mm. He bought. Well, they they used real skulls back in the day in Hollywood movies, you know. So yeah, yeah, Paul Guys. Yeah, Indiana Jones, you know, um, House on Haunted Hill. It's the first famously. time in charity shop I've heard it as a decoration in the window, though. I've heard of it in um, when they go to the sort of freak shows, you know, travelling carnival places, and sometimes they've actually had like real bodies, you know, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but yeah, well, let's move on to a very stupid dad, Gav. Very stupid dad. Well, Are you ready for this? Keeping the parental theme of this episode. It does a little bit, doesn't it? The parental Here, units. Here's the headline. You're going to be so angry with this man. Here's the headline. Man <laughs> man takes home one of the most venomous snakes in Australia to show his children who oh. all end up in hospital. Oh. I, I'm not going to get angry because this is like one of those extreme cases when, I, when like an electrical device which costs hundreds of pounds gets broken by the child and they, everybody's just like, oh no. You know, everyone looks at you, but you don't do it. You don't go there. You just go, okay. Oh dear. So, so this gentleman thought 
Here, take this venomous spider home. Snake. Snake. Um, to show his children, but yeah. unfortunately, it, it bit them all. Well, let me read the story. So, a snake expert says, well, this is a learning curve for all of us. Is it? Because the, there was a man hiking, uh, and he he realised not everything is very well here uh, I've been vomiting for 12 hours straight since being bitten by that snake yeah good one man so a man who found a snake out hiking took it home to show his children after it had already bitten him he then thought oh, I'll take it home to show my kids did he know no uh, I reckon this might have been taken out of context he might have taken it back with him then again you'd take a photo wouldn't you because if it, it had bitten it, you need to know what antidote him it bit him and he didn't he thought it was a non-venomous diamond python and he thought he thought well I might have bitten me but my kids will love to see this let me take it home and show them that's right okay I assumed he was taking it but like I said you'd take a photo of it to get the right antidote no he just wanted to show his kids but then he got sicker and sicker he got really sick and had to go to hospital but, but his kids at that point have been bitten too. Um, his hands were badly swollen, and they realised that the snake was not... He showed them a photo, and they said, Oh my God, this is... Uh, I can't remember what type of snake it was now, but a fatal snake, what, basically. Why did he think he was such a fucking snake expert? I don't know. Why would you trust in your faith if you're not an actual 110% snake fucking professional? Nine out of ten people bitten by this snake die if they don't get treated. He's a penis. Uh, the hiker was extremely lucky to make it out after being bitten uh, with first aid. Um, it could have ended up a lot worse. Um, luckily, his children were unharmed, but the snake was running amok in his house for six hours um, until they found it. Um, but they were halfway through treating him, and they said, So where is this snake now, sir? Uh, well, it's at home with my children. What? I, t- I took it home to show the kids, you know. I thought they'd like to see it. Ruth. <laughs> fucking idiot. Bonnie, get rid of the fucking snake. Phones up his wife. You know that snake I brought home? That's what I'm saying. Where is it? Oh, it's Johnny's gone to sleep in the bed with him. It's cuddling, isn't it? <laughs> so there we go. So that that's your second story. Thought that was fun, that fucking one. Fucking hell. I'm not getting angry because it's a waste of my energy. Now, I've got two more stories, one at either end of the scale. Okay. Uh, We're going to go with highbrow, science fiction, very American sort of story to kick things off. The other one is a very lowbrow British story. They're going to compare nicely. It's story time with Daniel. So, this this is fascinating. Have you ever heard of Andrew Carlson? He's a man who made $350 million, claims to be a time traveller. No. Okay. In March 2003, the FBI arrested a 44-year-old man named Andrew Carlson. He just enjoyed the luckiest run on the stock markets in history. He used $800, put them into investments, which immediately made $350 million. When was he arrested? 2003. Okay. So the authorities immediately saw this and thought, well, that you could only do this if you have inside information. Yeah. yeah. So they arrested him. But instead of denying it, he said, look, I'll tell you what's actually happened. I'll fully confess. I'm not an insider trader. Not at all. I'm not cheating in any way, in some ways. Let me explain what's happened here. I knew that this would work because I am a time traveler and I've come back 250 years from the future just to play around and see if I could make this money work with this $800, and I did. I'm a time traveller, Gavin, from the year, whatever, 250 years from now. I, uh, um, <clears throat> um, there's no comment from me yet. Continue. At first, his confession was not believed by the FBI. Uh, obviously. <laughs> They'd be worried if they did. Uh, I suppose well, we- unless it's Mulder. Uh, yeah. I don't know, Scully. I kind of believe that guy. <laughs> Did he mention anything about probing? I, I think there is a time travel episode. So yeah. uh, a spokesman for the Securities and Exchange Commission said this guy's either a lunatic or a pathological liar. 
he made capitalized on unexpected business developments which simply can't be pure luck the only way he could pull this off is with illegal inside information he's going to sit inside a jail cell until he agrees to give up this information and who his sources are but andrew never gave up his sources after he admitted he'd made a tactical error as part of his plea bargain to the fbi he said look look if you let me go i will give you the whereabouts of osama bin laden i'll give you the cure for aids because don't forget i'm from 250 years in the future yeah, but, uh, but hang on though <clears throat> when he was getting ready packing his bag to go back in time right yeah did he think i need bargaining chips what can i throw at them or bring the cure for aids but everyone might know the cure for aids by then why why in that time does everybody know the cure for aids is it taught why if it's a cure they don't need to there's no point of it i don't understand that what is he got it written down on paper what, I don't know. what, what, what is it i i okay carry on it's not known whether he revealed these secrets to the fbi no he didn't but the fbi were pr uh, determined to prove that he was lying um but they searched and searched and searched and they found no records of his existence he had no birth certificate there was no evidence that this man had ever existed before their arrest of him in 2003 i think i have heard of his story yeah very very strange the weirdest part of this story he is vanishes doesn't he yes they put up a one million pound bail that was paid by a completely unknown anonymous person and he vanished and no one's ever heard or seen from him again it's cool that's it? it so the guy made 350 million dollars out of 800 dollars but that probably the isn't biggest that's the biggest stock market jump in history he was just testing the wars though he because he didn't he's not likely to take that money back with him because what that money in that time isn't gonna be that great either yeah it's not gonna mean anything is it there's no, probably no money it's be at, like, at that point probably like three four hundred thousand now well there, there won't be money in that point i don't think Possibly. we'll have everything so, we need so he was just a, i find that <clears throat> the trouble is i find it a weird thing to come back and try and do and why is he the only one who's done that it's an interesting story because you know, it the opens FBI, the questions yeah and and, and it, the ending of it is nothing ever happened because he vanished somebody paid a million dollar bail on for him and you know that's plus that's a lot of money Obviously, and then he's gone quite strange yeah and never seen again sort of thing and no no record of him that is really the odd. only photo of him in existence is the mugshot that they took of him when they arrested him right. there's no they don't know who that guy is yeah it's just strange that why have not other people come back in time and done stuff or or maybe they have but just not this right now or while we're alive and record of it i don't know i, I don't can know. get deep with you on this but go to the next story so yeah there we go we'll go from do, that do one you, so we we'll go what, from time what do you think though i think he might be a time traveler okay well he's gone so maybe so we we go from time traveling stock market you know cheating to this very british headline and this is your your neck of the woods gav sorry this takes place in here's the headline woman rides motorbike naked then gets fingered in the street and punches a blind man wow it doesn't sound like saying in sorry unless it's maybe croydon uh woking oh okay yeah woking woking's not far yeah this lady has been jailed for 13 months and banned from entering Woking again. Right, funny thing is, at Woking, just at the train station, just opposite, there's a couple of like concrete sort of statues, like a soldier and stuff. Just there, for whatever reason, a massive big flower pots, uh, flower things where you could lean against. Don't know why. All the drunks go there, and the odd skag head. And they go, oh, I'm bad. And you walk past them, they're just hanging out. And that's where they hang out. And there's always like a woman with like almost boobs hanging out and stuff. So, yeah, that is just the high street. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to reveal her name because um, this is a fairly recent story. But, um, yeah, she's been banned from Woking and jailed for 13 months after she punched the blind man and was caught in the middle of a sex act in the street. It's not like <clears> he was looking. She's described as a mess by the judge. <laughs> Yeah. After she turned, yeah. after she turned up to the court four hours late. Brilliant. 
good stuff. Um, the judge revealed that she'd also been caught riding through Surrey towns naked on a motorbike. But well, added. Is, so is she the passenger or is she driving? She's driving it. Right, okay. But she, the judge said, we're not convicting you of anything here. This has nothing to do with that particular sentence, that particular incident. But I must mention that you have been caught several times riding a motorbike naked. She pleaded guilty uh, to uh, outraging public decency and she was caught and says, yes, yes, I was caught in the middle of a sex act. The judge said, yes, no doubt this was for money. Okay. So I think she might be a sex worker, I'm not sure. Um, but the prosecutor says, you were spotted in Woking on Beep Road being fingered by a man on July the 29th this year. He said fingered? Yeah. Well, that's the, She's, well you don't say... Judges don't mother, say fingered. A mother with two children approached her and said can you please stop what you're doing my children are here to which this lady said fuck off or i'll punch you and carried on getting fingered yeah i guess she was then arrested at the scene the police said when we arrested her she did actually have her jeans pulled up but her knickers were in her handbag right okay woken eh Apparently, that's she where Prince is... uh, Andrew uh, doesn't remember uh, to part in with a seventeen-year-old, and he was having pizza and not sweating. Well, she apparently is in the habit of befriending vulnerable young men and then taking full advantage of them. But trouble flared up when one of those men was threatened uh, with being kicked out of his flat by the local council because of his antisocial behaviour. They argued, and this lady then attacked him. And because he's registered blind, he couldn't tell how she was hitting him, whether it was her palm or her fist. Um, she was arrested for the attack, and then she assaulted the two officers who arrested her, calling them a fucking cunt. Okay. I still don't believe the judge had fingered. He did. No, he no, it wasn't did, the judge. It? it wasn't the judge. It was the prosecutor that said it. Oh, okay. Um... Any assault of a vulnerable person is very serious indeed. Uh, whether you slapped him or punched him, uh, as he doesn't, as he's blind, he doesn't know. You should still not have hit him. Um, you should not be riding around in front of people on a motorbike with no clothes on, and you certainly shouldn't be engaging in sex acts with vulnerable young men in the street in front of children. Um, you're a mess. Your life is a mess. This is the judge. You are a mess. A mess. Your life is a mess. I spoke to your son earlier, and it's a testament to something oh, in your son's life that he's been to court and finds this whole situation awful. I've made a criminal behaviour order against you. I'm restricting your movements and behaviour. You're banned from woking, and you're going to jail for 13 months. Wow. Oh, God. Poor son. Imagine that's your mum, you drunk like mum. It's just getting fingered in the street. I saw your mum the other day riding a motorbike. Oh, Naked. don't tell me that. Don't tell me you saw her riding a motorcycle. Yeah, um, so uh, we've gone from human skulls in a charity shop in Florida to a silly Australian dad bringing a snake home to his family. The tail then over to time travelling bank trading and blind men getting punched in the face and ladies getting fingered in the street. I'm glad I walked in Woken that day. <laughs> Could have been you. It's not it. far from me. And I do go there occasionally. What, where would you rather be in that scenario? Would you rather be riding around on a motorbike naked? Would you rather be getting punched um, by this lady? <laughs> or would you rather be fingering her? Which one? I want the motorbike, I think, in this scenario. What, you want to ride around naked on a motorbike? Yeah, because you can go quite quick. And There's you can not just really, zip up not really an good alleyway. choices either of them. I suppose that's why it's would you rather. I guess I'd be the blind one, because I don't want to be riding around naked on a motorbike. If you fall off, that's hurting. Hang I don't, on a minute. I don't... That, wasn't, that, that isn't one of the options, the blind one. You said you can't be a be blind, blind man. person and be punched. That's what you said. You could... Oh, okay. Did I? Sorry. All right. Do you want to be blind for a punched. day? Well, I don't want to f be fingering her. You, you wouldn't see it coming, I suppose, would you, if you got punched? Yeah. It'd be easier. Yeah. Yeah. It, fair enough. Well, there we go. Um, that's one of the strange... Uh, one of those will hopefully tickle your fancy out there. Bill Murray is definitely like the street lady being tickled. Um, Gimp is sleeping. Good. Uh, Bill. 
Take us out of here, Bill. Take us out. That's all the time we've got for this week on World of Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. Will she be okay? You do everything for me. You teach me. You cook for me. Am I a burden? Sweetheart, I could do more. I'm your mom. It's my job to take care of you when you need me. And you need me. Are you okay, Mom? Of course I'm okay. I have you. The medication has messed with her head. What's wrong? Sweetheart? Get me out of here! You need me. I really need you to help me. Chloe! Good night, sweet tooth. You need me. You figured it out. You need me. Okay, so we're into our second review. Run. Number two. 2020. Number two. Run from 2020. A homeschool teenager begins to suspect her mother is keeping a dark secret from her. Just it. Just a sentence. That's all we need. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I went into this. Sorry to cut you straight away there. I went into this with absolutely no knowledge whatsoever. I read nothing. I did nothing whatsoever. Uh, went to Netflix and went, play. Um, so for me, very, it felt like a very slow, burny type sort of film. You know? uh, I should mention both of these movies, Mum and Dad and this, are both on UK Netflix right now. So yeah. If you fancy watching them. Um, <clears throat> the director of this movie is uh, a gentleman by the name of Anish Chagananti. And Chagananti. I... Chagananti, let's not be mean about people's names. Um, he directed another movie, which I gave 8 out of 10, called Searching with John Cho, which did really, really well. Okay. Um, that, I, that I wasn't is... being nasty about his name. I just thought it sounded like Chagananti. It, did sa- it does sound like Chagananti. I'm not saying he, you know... He's not shagging Danny's. But yes, you've seen Searching as well, I believe. Uh, I've got it in my collection. It's a good movie. Really good movie. And yeah, so far, uh, not to reveal too much, but I really like what he's done in his career. He's really only done two main films, this run being the other one. Do you like what you see? I like what I see so far. (laughs) And I see what I like. (laughs) All right, Bill Cosby. uh, (laughs) Shabba de baba de boo. Just drink what's in this. Come on, baba de boo. See what I like. Um, I like what I see. Give me the bow. It's the Cosby Show. Yeah. Uh, this, as He's we out, mentioned though, earlier, he? he must be like he must be innocent. Oh yeah, of course. This stars Sarah Paulson, uh, who I mentioned earlier. Gav's not hundred percent familiar I, with her, I, but she's. I looked her up, and I've this is the first thing I've ever seen her in. I've not seen any other thing she's been in. I looked up her whole uh, Easy. back catalogue. Bird Box? Have you not seen Bird Box or Family Guy? Or I've seen Family Guy, but that's a, that's a, her talk, her voice. She's not. Yeah. American Horror Story, American no, Crime that's Story. Not seen her. Oh, I have seen The Call, actually. There's, there's got that. I have seen The Call. Yeah. Oh, is that actually um, her? But she's she's awesome. Um, she is. A, no, it's not. She's not. In everything that. she's in, particularly the American Horror Story, she's a really great actor. 
and can you know turn herself into a lots of different characters but she's she's good in this i've never yeah, really I seen she's good. her yeah as and i'll spoil it i've never seen her as a baddie too much um she's normally not too evil but like you said it's a slow burn this movie and she is you really feel for the the young lady her daughter of this played by kira allen who is a real life wheelchair user uh, they they didn't want to cast apparently the the studio toyed with the idea of oh. casting an able-bodied person but oh, oh, oh i didn't notice yeah so um <clears throat> they you really feel for her because like with a pregnant woman or a child in a film that's in peril, you always feel like, oh, they're quite vulnerable. I hope they're okay. And because this, not that we should feel this way, but because she is in a wheelchair and she's not able to 100% defend herself against the things that are happening to her, you do feel for this, this the daughter in this. And um, it's, it's great. And we will spoil this immediately by saying this is a movie about Munchausen's by proxy. Um, which is where you, the normally the mum, actually, uh, this is a real life thing, and, and I'm sure many of you listeners will have heard of this. But it's where the parent, normally the mother, keeps the do, the child, daughter or son, sick, so that they can continue to look after them forever. Essentially, it's a mental illness. It's a recognised disease or disorder. I've done an episode um, on my uh, other podcast, yeah, High Strangers say. podcast. It's an yeah. early one, maybe very early. So if you guys tens. check out uh, the High Strangers podcast and just in the Google proxy. search, chuck in Munchausen's. Um, famously, Eminem's mum, Kim Mathers, had Munchausen's. She kept Eminem or Marshall very sick as a child, very small, withered, uh, weathered, sorry. And that's the same sort of thing as what's going on in here. So that's kind of the, the film spoiled for you. But I feel like, you know, we always say spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. So going into knowing that, and I kind of guessed that within a few minutes of this film, that that, that might be the case, because this was a first time watch for me and Gav. Um, but I'm going to say it right now. This was fucking great. This film really kept the tension going for me. Well, it's a very much a, a Hitchcock thriller. Type really thing. was, really was. You got your rear it's window. Not, it's not a horror movie. It's a thriller, a dark thriller, it, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it, it's the only elements of it that are close to horror are because there is a oh, it's there horrific is, nature there, throughout, really, isn't it? Yeah, and and there's there is something, there is peril, there is threat. Kind of, and, kind of flowers in the attic. Do you remember that movie? I do. Hmm. But also, I get a really strong um, hereditary yeah. vibe from this as it's well. The, it's, it's the family dynamic as well, and sort of the, the way the house is, and it's quite dull. Yeah, uh, it's, it's very, a real desaturated uh, uh, beige colour throughout. Very, it's, it's a small production, but because of that, oh, it's, it's done, it's, it's, it's nice, polished. It's, it's yeah, nice it's looking. really polished, it's good sets, good acting. It um, works perfect for what this is. Like I say, it's a real slow burn, and it's it's a story. You go along with the journey with the girl. Uh, that's who you're, uh, uh, sorry, not, excuse sort of pun, riding along with. That's who, who you sort of travel with, is in, like, her journey and her watch, like, yeah. when she gets out of uh, the, uh, the, the building, and she's crawling along. You know, up on the rooftop I mean, and stuff, and you're, you're with her on that doing that whole sort of journey. And it is good, and, and you really want her to get out of it, so you're very much with her, and it's quite good. But yeah, at <laughs> first, at the beginning, obviously, it has that kind of friendly twist thing at the first, at the beginning. You're with the mum, thinking the mum's doing the right thing, how much she loves her, and it shows how much she loves her throughout at the beginning through things. Yeah, and it's a great little bit of acting from Sarah Paulson to be able, and she probably would have jumped at this script because she gets to switch from being this what looks like a lovely doting mother to suddenly finding out that this she's a monster mm -hmm. um the other thing we probably should Spoil say right from the yeah, beginning is a spoiler you, know, you probably need to watch this before. yeah 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 <laughs> but, um, but the, if not you know the other thing we should say right at the beginning is this is just there's a lot of misery stephen king's misery in this as well yeah misery, um, misery. Uh, there's a few scenes that feel like they borrow but in a good way from that from that movie um well yeah let's start then so we start off by seeing a baby being resussed uh, resuscitated in hospital just moments after it's been born that baby doesn't seem well but it's then in an incubator and we do see sarah paulson mum crying um and then we cut to present day 
So we assume that that baby is fine, turned into the daughter, um, and she's in a wheelchair. And we do get a list of, during just before the credits, we get a list of uh, conditions, which we, we learn then within a few moments that this daughter has all of these conditions. She has diabetes. She has a problem with her lungs where she needs to cough up. She has rashes all over her. She also can't use her legs. Um, we, she, we, she's got seven or eight serious conditions. Yeah, we do actually see the rashes, though. That isn't a uh, figment of anyone's yeah. imagination on that, though. Well, none of the things are a figment of the imagination because mum knows what drugs to give her to oh, bring to, on to, all of these conditions. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, yeah, you're right. No, we do see the rashes, and, you know, this 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 girl thinks... Quite rightly so, you know. My mum's looking after me as best she can. Um, yeah, my mum loves me, and it's it's um, yeah, it's it's the the trust going. There's a, you can kind of see it, and you kind of feel sorry for her when she realises not to jump ahead, but when she sort of realises that the pill isn't a correct pill, and she starts to think it's kind of like you can remember magic going oh that's rude my mum's put the wrong thing in like that and then slowly just in that next 10 minutes five minutes going it's my mum trying to do this on purpose like give me mm. something which i shouldn't have like what and again and great acting horrible. from kira allen and it's it's kind of got a sort not a, I feel like a Silence of the Lambs in a way, like the the tension, not not the type of film, but the sort of the way it's built with the editing and stuff as well, and just the way she's with, like you say, with um, um, Thing Majiggy, the snowy movie, Misery, Misery. Uh, <laughs> being like trapped trapped in a place and not being able to get out, and obviously the wheelchair situation being up on the top floor and the stair gate being locked off, so she can't use it like the elect the uh, chair. So yeah, it's 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 got a lot of cool things going for it in a way. It's a nice little tight little uh, little thriller. Yeah. Well, Mum's had it good for seventeen years. She's been able to look after her daughter for seventeen years, homeschooling her, basically keeping her from the outside world. You know, she hasn't found out anything about the outside world. She's seventeen, and she not, is about to go. Not- Sorry, but I say not even allowed like the internet. Like, like it's locked off at her night times. It's turned off, yeah. and she's there's like one computer in the like the well, living room downstairs. N- only when things start, she has the internet, but then things it, it, the the internet doesn't work when she needs it later on in the movie. So, she as far as she knows, her daughter Chloe has got everything she needs, and she's even applied to some colleges. But that has meant that she will now be allowed out into the outside world and she will find out potentially that everything she's been told is a lie so mum has now gone into crazy mode which we don't know any of this yet this is all going on behind the scenes we just as far as we know chloe's just this ill girl in a wheelchair yeah. being looked after by her mum and her yeah. mum she's at this homeschool association meeting with all these other people she says, oh, my daughter is brilliant. She's going to be brilliant when she goes out there. I'm sure she's she's going to be brilliant. But secretly, she's thinking, she's not going anywhere. She's not going anywhere. I'm going to hide all the college letters from her. We don't know this, though. No, we don't know this at the time. You but, don't know this if you're, if you're like, talking about it again now or re-watching this film. Um, yeah, at, at this point, though, like I said, I didn't know nothing. I didn't read the blurb. I don't know nothing. I saw all run and the girl's in a wheelchair. And I was like, okay what's going on there but i didn't really think of it much um but yes um i didn't know which way it was going so yes i still trust the mum like the uh, our protagonist does totally and we find out two weird things not weird two things here now we find out that chloe the daughter is extremely clever very intelligent got a great mind for um science and mechanics She's building some electronic device. She's really great with, with computers, all that kind of stuff. So she's a very clever girl. Could definitely get into a lot of the colleges she's applying for. She's got skills. I like, I, it, like, uh, I like the interest she's in because it's kind of offbeat, nerdy sort of stuff. But she is, yeah. she is devoted, and I like that. Yeah. She's well into it. She's problem solver. I, I, I dig that. I, I like, I like other, to always sort of stay in and not do stuff and shit like that, you know. But in contrast to that, we also find out that at night time... Mummy goes down into the basement to a special office that she's got in the basement that she knows that Chloe can't get to because it's downstairs. And she drinks a big old pint of red wine and watches videotapes of her daughter as a baby. 
and she has a funny look on her face while she does it. It's all a bit sort of weird. I'm somebody else now. <laughs> it's very strange. Um, but that's fine. So Chloe is waiting for letters from college. Mum says to her every day, look, as soon as the letter arrives, Chloe, I'll bring it to you. I promise you I won't open the letter. I know you're excited to hear back from Washington College. But, um, you know, I'll let you know, let you know. One day she brings in some shopping, leaves it on the table, and Chloe thinks, oh, maybe the letters are in there. She finds some tablets, Gavin. Gosh. And she thinks, oh, it's weird. They've got my mum's name on these tablets. But yeah. They're, but they're my tablets. That's... Yeah, it's like that. That's that. Not like your reaction. There's her reaction, and it's where you're like, oh, because you, you, well, I didn't, because I still didn't know what was going on either. So I'm probably with that going. Is, is the mum trying to do that? So I think I'm learning at the same time as she is, and I quite enjoy this. Well, I think to be honest with you, I was. I wasn't that far that's ahead what I'm of saying. the plot. I think the audience is in, in, is learning it as they are with her. Well, later on, obviously, um, mum comes in the room and says, "Oh, Chloe, here's your tablet," and Chloe says. I'm just going to ask you some questions. Um, the tablets, they had your name on them. And mum starts gaslighting her. She says, no, 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 no. The receipt had my name on them. The receipt was wrapped around the jar. But they're your tablets. Don't worry. But they have changed the way that the tablets look. They're a different brand now. So that's why they look like that. But don't worry. You know, it's, it's, it's not anything weird. It's just the receipt had my name on it. So the next day when mum's out, Chloe goes in the bathroom and she uses like a, a grabbery device to pick them down off the shelf. Yep. She peels back the label that's got her name on it and underneath it is in fact her mum's name. Oh! Yeah. It's not good. It's not good, is it? Not it's like, really. a, like you said, it's, it's a good thriller, it, this. It, well, we actually have coming up soon a real Hitchcock type thriller thing. It's got where she's in She's quickly like in the cinema and said, "I'm just going to go yeah, to the toilet yeah. or the kiosk or whatever," and and has quickly gone to the chemist to find out what the pills are. But we will get to it. We will get to it. Well, she spits back up the pill, and she sneaks downstairs at night. Now she's got a stair lift, which makes some noise, but it's fairly silent. So she goes down and says, she goes online. She thinks, "I'm just going to Google these new drugs because something in the back of my brain is nagging at me here. I don't." I don't know what it is. And she just as she hits enter, she types in the type of the drug into Google. Just as she's about to hit enter, the internet dies. And she thinks, what the fuck? Now, what she doesn't see, but what we as the audience see, is her mum in the background behind her, like a ghost just watching her from the corner of the room. That is terrifying when I saw that I said to Alice Jesus Christ her mum's in the back there can you see her what the fuck and she's just like this shadow like <sighs> horrible great uh, stuff yeah uh, and that's uh, that's our first indication of no like oh she's done it on purpose mm. we're now ahead of the daughter knowing what's going on yeah you're right so we've caught up and now we're slightly ahead, ahead. yeah <clears throat> Now, we now know that mum will do anything to keep this facade up. Because in the morning, mum yeah. is on the phone, and I use air quotes, on the phone to the internet people. Go, this isn't good enough. What do I pay for? This is nonsense. Come on. What do you mean there's going to be no internet for the next week? This is awful. And she, and she sort of turns to her daughter after, us, and she says, oh, is the internet down? And she's like... Yeah, how did you know that? Yeah, I tried to use it in the night, Mum, but um, it wouldn't work. She said, oh, oh I'm so want, sorry. Why do you want the internet? She said, oh, looking up something could do with printer. Yeah. And then she says, oh, yeah, well, I, don't, I can't guarantee when we're going to get it back, Chloe. We might not have it for a month. Who knows? They just wouldn't tell me. That's nonsense. If your internet goes out, you get it back up within 24, 48 hours normally, depending on the severity of what's happened. But Mum is BSing her, really BSing her, really gaslighting her. Uh -oh. Her mum must have known that this day was going to come. Really tense moment now. Because mum goes outside to do some gardening. And Chloe thinks, right, I'm going to, if I can't get online, I'm going to call the pharmacy. I'm going to use my to really long, long cabled phone. Oh, yeah. Landline. 
So she rings directory inquiries, and it's taking forever. Four one one. Hello, directory inquiry. Yeah, four one one. How can I help? <clears throat> put me through to a pharmacy. Which one? I don't care. Just any one. Your nearest farm. Yeah, just put me through to that one. And all the while, she keeps looking in the garden, making sure her mum's still in the garden. She gets through to the pharmacy, and then um, she hangs up because she realises it's going to be a charged call, and it will show on the the um, the phone bill. Because it says the next call will charge you, and she hangs up. Yeah. So she thinks, oh, I can't ring them. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So, weird scene, Gav. She rings just a random number. She makes up a number, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. Let's say his name's Kevin. I like her style, actually. Yeah, it's great. Let's say his name's Kevin. Ring, ring. You, you can be Kevin. Go on, be Kevin. Hello. Ring, ring. Hi, can you do me a favour? Can you use Google for me? I know you don't know me. I'm a 17-year-old girl in a wheelchair, and I just need you to Google something for me. Yeah. He's like, what? What are you... Why? What will you do it? She's like, I haven't got the internet. But then his um, kids are shouting away. So hang on. Uh, stop, stop it. Stop it. No, no. It, yeah, like, what do you wife... want? Why are you selling to me? I'm not selling anything. You've got the internet. Why? Why can't you do it? I, I can't. I, I just can't. Can you do it? <laughs> Then he starts shouting to the kids again and saying, "She says you're 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 a great person. You're such yeah, a good." Yeah, she dad. says, "She says your wife loves you, or something, or your kids love you, something like that." You know, and and she basically makes him go, "All right, let me do this. This is the weirdest phone call I've ever had. I'll Google it. Right, how do you spell it? Trioxy, and he types it in, and he says, "Right, it says that this drug is used to treat heart conditions." And she's like, "Okay, yeah, but what what does the pill look like?" And he says, uh, "It's a red pill." And she's got a bottle of green pills. Yeah, so she, so she knows. needs to know what are the green pills. So this girl is so clever. She's thinking, what can I do? What can I do? We need to get out of the house. What does she suggest? Cinema. This is like, yeah, so this is like in Misery when he says to her, I'd love to have dinner with you one night cause so, he can, so he can put the drugs in her drink. It's like that. Mum, can we go to the cinema? So that when we when we're at the cinema, I can say that I need to go and use the bathroom, and I can go and go to the pharmacy that's across the road from the cinema and speak to them in five minutes whilst you think I'm in the bathroom during the movie. Very clever stuff. Yeah. So she says, "I'm just going to the bathroom." She does, and then the tense, the tension as she's pressing the button, waiting for the the, the zebra crossing. Yeah, it's- Ta, 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 and then ta, ta. there's people in her way and she's wheeling around them. There's, there's a line in the pharmacy and so she's, she just pulls the disabled card. That's why I've written the disabled card because there's a huge queue and she just says, sorry, I'm a very vulnerable girl. Just goes disabled, possible, girl disabled, girl, disabled, can't help myself. <laughs> you ha- can't, no one can help me. I always oh, just says a load of shit and just goes past well, the first guy's annoyed because she says, sorry, can I just cut in front of you? And he looks around as if to say, you what? And then he sees she's in the wheelchair and he's like, oh, well, yes, of course, please do. Um, but yeah, she jumps straight to the front of the queue and she says to the lady. The well, she, well, oh, she says, oh, what are you doing here? This is very hello, strange. Hello, Chloe. Where, where's your mum? What are you doing here? You know. She says, oh, I need you to tell me... Um, the which what these drugs are that mum got for me we're playing a and, game well she comes she says that in a minute so the lady looks at him she says well there aren't any drugs in your name she says oh sorry you're right they're actually in my mum's name she's like oh because of data protection i can't give you that information because it's private i know it's your mum but I'm, I'm not allowed to give out any information because it's her medication she's like well hang on a minute um uh i'm playing a scavenger hunt with mum and my goal is to find out um, the name of the drug that she's taking. Um, Mum doesn't think I'll come in here to ask you this. And she goes, oh, I do love a good game, Chloe, but um, oh, I can't. I'm really sorry. I can't. I can't, just can't do it. And all the while, she keeps hearing people coming in. The door goes ding every time. And she's thinking, is Mum going to come in? Is Mum going to come in? And finally, the woman says to her, ah, I've, I found it. It's not even a medicine. I can tell you what it is. We actually also... Um, link, are linked up with the local veterinary surgery and this is a, a dog tablet it's to relax the muscles of a dog it's muscle relaxant yeah she says oh, can, you, can, can, you, can you tell me what would happen if a, if a human took it but, and just as the lady starts you hear her name to, being screamed uh, Chloe 
Chloe! Oh, hello. Chloe! And Mummy's come in the pharmacy. And she runs over just as the lady says, well, I guess you, you wouldn't be able to lose, use your legs, your limbs properly. And then she goes into a full-blown panic attack. Mum gives her a, a diabetic insulin injection. And we fade to black. Yeah. And we cut to a scene which I don't know why they left it in, really. But Sarah Paulson is in the shower with a huge scar on her back, showing that she was abused as a child. Right. That's what that's what this is to demonstrate. Although we don't really come back to it, but no, there is apparently. I didn't know why that was there actually. Yeah. yeah apparently, there is some stuff um, from scenes that they were going to or did film, but didn't get make it in. But yeah, apparently, she was abused as a child by her mother. Um, and then Sarah Paulson practices what she might say. So again, she's a bit like the the lady from Misery. She's practicing what she would say if she phoned up the pharmacy. I need to know what it is you told my daughter. I want you to call my daughter and assure her that I wouldn't give her it's such dog weird tablets. Requests you, you, if your customers doing that, you're like, what? In my spare time, start ringing up the fucking your daughter saying, like, oh, don't worry, it's all right if I explain stuff. No, I'm <laughs> such a weird request, isn't it? Well, she then Google's, she goes online, mum, and she Google's what household neurotoxins are there. So what is there lying around the house that I can use to poison someone or to hurt somebody through chemicals? So she's now looking up this because yeah. she's thinking, well, I need to I need to go deeper with this. Chloe wakes up and she realises that she's locked in her room. The door is locked. She realises she's just in rear window, Hitchcock's rear window now. She's a prisoner right now. In a wheelchair, yeah. The first thing we as an audience see is a big plate of breakfast from mum. But the first thing we as an audience think is, your mum's just been Googling neurotoxins. Do not eat anything that she's prepared for you. Yeah, that's annoying, but isn't it? Chloe doesn't know that. St- st- uh, so stuck up there in a wheelchair and you can't do anything. And all you've got to do is, you've got to eat or you're going to starve. But if you eat, you're just going to stay ill. It's like, oh, shit, isn't it? Well, the clever girl that she is, she picks the lock of her bedroom door and then realises that her mum has put a rake across the handle on the other side. Right, can we, we, let's not just do that that quickly. This elaborate fucking mission to get round into her mum's room. Oh, no, we're not even there yet. Yeah, we're not. No, we're not. She picks the lock from the inside of her bedroom, but she can't open the door because there's a rake across the outside. Yeah, okay, then, all right, fine. So then she thinks... How am I gonna? How am I gonna get out now? This is ridiculous. I know what. Even though I can't use my legs, what I'm gonna do here is, is I'm gonna fucking ridiculous. It's amazing. It's ridiculous. <laughs> why is this amazing? And I'll tell you why it's fucking ridiculous. Go. Because because she's so desperate. This is exactly like the scene in Misery where he drags his dead legs across the floor to try and you know get the, whatever it is he's doing and then he knocks the penguin over and that's how she catches him because he knocked the penguin over yeah. when he was locking the door it's just like that yeah. it's tension if you can't use her legs yeah. she's dragging herself yeah. across the room for any of you this it's the method what with the water in her mouth it's fucking ridiculous she keeps so so gav is referring to chloe keeping a mouth of the water while she crawls herself her disabled body that before, doesn't work across the roof. Before she's done this, she's daisy chained loads of extension cables together, which she just happened to have in the, around. With a soldering iron on the end. With a soldering iron and puts in so a big she glass can of water, then, puts her mouth. Then she heats up the glass with a soldering iron well, to well, her well, mum's well, bedroom well, window. She crawls for quite a long time, dragging extension daisy chain extension cable along with a hot thing, hot uh, iron thing, whatever it is. Round to her parents' window, and what happens, Dan? She spits. Uh, she heats up the window with the soldering iron, and then when the glass has been really fully heated, she then spits water on it and shatters the window. Well, fuck off! Take the don't make the daisy chain extension cable. Don't use a mouth of water. Just use Crawl a brick. Crawl there. Use the uh, soldering iron and smash the fucking window, you dopey cow. I think she did really well. Fuck off, did she? It is ridiculous, but I enjoyed watching it. I I was like, what is she going to do? This is going to be incredible. Alice was saying to me, what has she got in her mouth? Is she having a seizure? Why is she doing it? I said, 
I think she's got a mouthful of water that she's going to use. Oh, my God. She's going to use it with a hot soldering iron. Alice was like, what would that do? I said, and just as I said, was about to say it, the glass shattered. And I said that, apparently. It's fucking Home alone. shit. It's so <laughs> shit. So I thought, I was like, no. oh, my God, what's she going to do? She gets around it. I was like, oh, my God, she's going to spit onto the a solder and iron and set a fire from an extension cables in a room <laughs> set a fire so an ambulance would come along and save her because there's a fire going on in her room that's what i thought no well she then smash she then climbs in through the window lands on all the broken what? glass has what? has an asthma what? Hang on. i still want to go back to this what if she just got up to it just caught up to it and, went, <clears throat> and coughed and spat the water out what was her plan then crawl all the way back again do Have another drink. Fuck off. Look, I, I must admit, Gav, you've talked me into <sighs> this. This is definitely an area that you have to suspend your disbelief. But I was enjoying it so much that I went along with the ride for it, okay? Yeah, all right. She goes into her bedroom. She has an asthma attack on the floor, but she manages to... <laughs> so I don't mean, I'm not laughing because she has an <laughs> asthma attack. And just after that whole fucking event and stuff, if you hadn't been holding that glass of water in your mouth, you might not have had the asthma attack because yeah. you could probably breathe well, properly. Well, she manages to crawl into her bedroom and grab her ventilator and inhaler. And we get a great moment now where she thinks, right, now I, now I can breathe again. I'm going to go down the stairs. And as she goes to use the stair lift... It's cut out. She realizes, yep, yeah, and it cuts from her. She just goes, Mother, f-, and it cuts to the next scene, which I thought was a nice little scene there. We then see her just think, Right, well, I've got to get down these fucking stairs, haven't I? Could she have not crawled up onto the banister on her stomach a bit in her arms and slid down it? I don't know. I think she's time is of the essence here. She just throws herself down well, it. She throws a wheelchair first of all down, and then she just then throws herself onto throws a wheelchair. herself onto the wheelchair. She looks pretty bad when she's landed. She may have broken some bones here. I think she should have tried sliding down the banister. But, but Gav, because yeah. she hasn't taken the dog muscle relaxants, when she wakes up, she looks down at her toes. She has a Uma Thurman Kill Bill moment. She has a little toe wiggle. Which is great. We then cut to mum heading home in the car. But she manages to leave house. See my girl. Do, 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 do. But Chloe gets out of the house in a wheelchair. And this is my fate. This is where the film really got and so good for me with the postman. The lovely, lovely postman. Poor old postman. Dude from the innkeepers. Yeah, mailman, Pat Healy. Played by Pat Healy. Um, so she's, she's driving postman along. Postman Pat. Postman Pat. It is Postman Pat. <laughs> Hilarious. For any non-UK listeners, there is a an animated postman character Pat, called Postman, postman Pat. Postman Pat, Postman, postman Pat, and, and it's black and white. Cat, early in the, in the morning. morning. What else? It, what's the next line? Just as day is dawning, dawning. Pat picks up the post stuff in his uh, Batman or something. Uh, I don't know. There you, go. there you go, Rachel. You get us bloody singing post from Pat. Pat. I never, we've never enough. done that. We've never done that. Oh, that rhymed. That did. <laughs> um, post from Pat. We've never done that. Do you want to hear what we used to sing at school? What? Postman Pat, Postman Pat, Postman Pat just ran over his cat. All his guts are flying. Postman Pat is crying. Have you ever seen a cat as flat as that? That's what we used to sing at school. Lovely. <laughs> uh, right. So this is my favourite scene. So she gets out of the house. She's obviously the the road is flat. So she's wheeling herself in the wheelchair through the road. She hears a car coming and she thinks, fuck, that could be mum because not many people live around here. I better go and hide in the trees. And then she does. And she sees that it's actually the mailman truck. So she pulls out in front of the truck. He skids just near her, inches from her. And he's, she's like, can you help me, please? Can you help me? It's Postman Pat. He says, all right, what's going on? And she says, my mum's trying to hurt me. You know, I know this is going to be unbelievable, but look at the state of me. You know, I've, I've really hurt myself getting out of the house. Mum's been drugging me and basically keeping me prisoner my whole life. And he's like, oh, all right, look, I believe you. Let's get you in the, the van. And as he starts to wheel around in the distance around the corner, mummy's car. Mm -hmm. And so he quickly wheels her back around in front of the car. So she's out of view. And well, she, says, she's like, I think, think Mum saw. 
Yeah, he says, I think she, she says, I think he saw, she saw me. This is the point, though. We know now that she is full on psycho more than uh, the daughter knows at yeah. this point. Oh, and yeah. And even Postman Pat knows. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're just there, and we, I'm just like, is she going to go back, get a gun, the mum, get a gun, just come back and shoot Postman Pat? All we need now is Fireman Sam to do that. <laughs> Sam to Sam and Thomas amazing. the Tank Engine. And then the former. Thomas the Tank Engine. Oh. Oh, dear. Yes, yeah, so he confronts her. Postman Pat, as we call him, goes up to Sarah Paulson and says, look, look, stop. I'm going to take her to hospital. She says, you've hurt her. You've been hurting her. And she puts on a really good act, Mum. She says, how dare you? I'm her mother. She's had, she's on different drugs, which are really messing with her brain. How dare you tell me as her mother that I've been hurting her? And also, what about you are an older man who has found a vulnerable 17-year-old girl bleeding in the woods what would happen to your reputation if I told people about this? And at this point, you obviously expect him to go, oh, yeah, you're right, okay, get to it. He doesn't, and he actually just dispenses the belief of that and says, uh, actually, uh, no, I'm still going to take her to the hospital. Yeah, and she says, well, I'm going to call the police. And he goes, and he says, oh, okay. there's no signal. Oh, yeah, you know, we both know there's no signal. So, and then he says, do you want to f- f- uh, follow me there? She says, yeah, she says, can I at least follow you to the hospital? He says, yeah, of course. Says, but... Yeah, of course. So he puts her in the back, it puts um, Chloe in the back of the... She's super happy. She's like, what's going to happen? He's like, I'll take you to the hospital. And she's like, oh, oh so She said, No, she says, can I request Please that you actually pad. take me to the police Please station? Pad. Take me she to actually... the police station. Yeah, she says, don't take me to the hospital, take me to the police station. He says, whatever you want, I'll do it. Um, whilst they're talking and he says to her, look, in a minute when I start the truck, you might get some of these parcels moving around. And if any fall off the shelf, I do apologise. But before he can finish his sentence, Mama Bear has snuck up behind him with a great big diabetic needle that she's stabbed him in the neck with really hard. Oh. And he's knocked out or dead or something, isn't he? Yeah. And that's, that's the end of that scene. Now we wake up in Mama's basement. Ooh. Mama's Mama's special office basement. Sounds like a video, a naughty video. Mama's orifice office. <laughs> oh, no, now we wake up in Mama's basement. Oh God. Um, yes. So Chloe wakes up in That's the what basement. That woman in Woken was up to, wasn't it? Come and have a look in my basement. Uh, everybody was looking at that basement in that, that town. She's parading it around on a Kawasaki. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Chloe wakes up in the basement of her house. That We, we mentioned earlier that we saw Mummy drinking big bottles of wine. In, and she realises there's this big um, office that she didn't really know about that her mum has, which is where mum studies all these chemistries and drugs and keeps things hidden from her, including videotapes with her mum's name on them. Um, she finds the letter of college application that says we successfully allow you to come to our college. Mum never told her that she got into the college that she applied for. Which was obvious, though. Yeah, of course. She screams and she goes to go closer to the video um, player, the VHS player, and realises she's got a chain around her ankle. She can only go so far in the room. Mm. She's still a prisoner. She does find a photo of herself running as a child, which was a bit like, oh, that's a bit shit. Yeah, so I used to be able to walk. This is weird. And all the videotapes have got this um, her mum's name on them. Um, she finds, though, all the all, it all comes out here. She finds a death certificate with her name on it and thinks, what? Then she finds a newspaper article about a stolen baby and... Now, through flashbacks, we find out that Sarah Paulson's baby that we saw in the opening scene did sadly pass away moments after it was born. And in a crazy moment, a psychotic episode moment, Sarah Paulson stole a perfectly healthy baby from another couple in the hospital. That baby she then brought up, keeping it drugged. This is Chloe. She changed its name to Chloe, which is what she called her baby before it died. And she's been keeping it 
under Munchausen's by proxy all these 17 long years keeping it drugged keeping her drugged and disabled so she cannot escape and she finds an um all of this out and it she actually thinks to herself am i actually sick what what's going on this is where mum catches her and she says you're not my real mum she's like well look i am i saved you she says am i am i even sick have you just been poisoning me? And she says, Chloe, 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 let's start over. Let me get you this needle full of black liquid that I'm going to inject into you. And you'll everything will be fine once I've injected you with this. Now, if a woman approaches you, Gav, with a needle full of black liquid, what are your first thoughts there? Don't inject I me with it. Keep the black liquid out of me. Yeah, don't put black liquid in me. It's just horrible, though, the stuff that she's... It's like paint thinner. It's like, oh, my God. Well, luckily, Chloe that, that, locks that, herself... It's just basically going to kill you, you know. Chloe luckily locks herself in a cupboard, <clears throat> um, and she grabs a bottle of, basically, uh, like, Well, she's stuck. Acid. What, what is she going to do? What can you do in that situation, Dan? What would you do if you didn't have that? It is well, really, she, like, stuck, like... She knows she's either got to get... At, She's got to get the, the hospital there, or, or, or the only way to do that is to endanger herself. And she says, "You need me, Mum, as much as I need you." And she downs in front of her mum. She downs this bottle of like acid, or, or I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, it eats, starts eating through her stomach. And she's mum's like, "What do I do? I'm going to have to take her to hospital now because I don't want her to die." So she takes her to hospital. They operate on her. They pump her stomach, and she kind of is going to be alright. But, but she has she's a, paralyzed. A, a tube down her uh, mouth, so uh, she can't speak, unfortunately, she, at the moment. And she can't move her arms. Like, although yeah, it was only down, her legs that yeah. are paralyzed, she can barely move her body. So she's got that kind of sleep paralysis nightmare thing now. Um, and Mum's looking at her through the window, isn't she? Looking into her, her hospital room, just staring at her, yeah. and. She needs she she needs to be interviewed to find out what was going on. And Chloe tries to tell the nurse. She says, mm, 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 mm. and the nurse is like, "What? What do you want?" No, I can't let you use a pencil. I'm afraid I'm not like because you're a suicide risk. Oh, I can let you use a crayon. Let me get a crayon. What are you trying to say? What are you trying to say here? So she starts writing a word on the on the paper with a crayon, and um. Just as she started to write this word, mum's mum sets off the alarms in the hospital yeah. and kidnaps her. Yeah. Wheels are along. She says, "You need me because I'm your mum, and I'm going to keep looking after you for the rest of your life." She wheels her through the hospital corridors. The nurse comes back in the room and says, "Oh," she rings up. She says, oh, "The patient's gone. Did you take Chloe from the room?" What do you mean you haven't taken her? Well, she's not here. And then she finds on the on the piece of paper the word "mom" that she was trying to write down um, so with she, the crayon. She puts two and two together. Yep, she's a clever nurse. Um, but Mum's got a gun. That's the other thing that Mum we didn't realise. Mum is so crazy. She now's got now got a gun, and the police catch up with them. She pulls the gun and says, "You stay away from me. Stay away from my baby." They shoot Mum. Yeah, it, it's it's quite all. Of a, I didn't know it was going to go this route actually, because it's been all in the house the whole time, and then the hospital. Then it's very quickly goes to the point of like it finishing. It's, it seems quite. I thought there'd be more to it than just this. I thought they would have got further away. Uh, yeah, it I seems really like, does... Oh, okay. But I'm grateful that it doesn't outstay its welcome because we do I often guess, say, I guess. you know, at least it ends. So I, yeah, and I'm happy, and I'm Not very like satisfied. Time. Satisfied with the ending. The ending is seven years later. Chloe is an older woman with her own child. It turns out, and she's she's a teacher as well. Um, and she goes to a prison for women. Okay, I I before you even start doing this, when is she is shot and she's at the bottom of the stairs, and the people come over to her. Uh, uh, the movie finishes there. This is forced to fuck for no reason. Tell I like every, it. Of course you do. You, you probably no, give but, it 9 out of 10. 
No, and I like Just it. And I'm sure Rachel, Rachel likes it because this this is like really the revenge part of it now. She's treated Chloe so badly for her whole life. This is Chloe. Chloe, and sadly, like a lot of people who have chosen spy proxy inflicted on them, she's now not very well herself to the point that she goes to visit her mum once a month or however often it is tells her all about her daughter oh she asks after her grandmother sometimes she talks about the children she's teaching um and her mum looks like a corpse because she's still alive she sat there and then just as she's about to leave she says well i better go um let me just spit this out and she spits out some medication and says right time for you to open wide mum so she's now keeping her mum drugged with whatever poison or whatever this is and yes okay it is maybe far-fetched and maybe unneeded but i quite it, it it's what elevates this above thriller to a little bit more of a horror film it's got that kind of orphan it's cheap vibe to it um, i don't think it is no point have her just like that dying at the end it's like the problem that's, that's no what way get. man she needs to suffer and pay for what she's done to chloe and she does and although chloe is going to be sadly not very well in the brain because she's now poisoning her mum i love it i love it and I, I like that they did it and i don't give this a nine out of ten but i do give it an eight out of ten um it, it was really uh, blew me uh, away uh, actually um for a film i'd never even heard of for Rachel to suggest it and I sat there and watched it and at the end of it I was like fucking hell that was really good and it, that again in in a couple of viewings time that might drop down it might go down as low as a 6 6.5 but right now that's a it was a great film and I'll happily watch that again now now I know the whole plot I want to go into it again probably in the next couple of months and Alice wants to watch it again knowing what we know and seeing it right from the beginning all the way through and spotting all the ways that mum's manipulating her do you know what I mean I think I think it's going to be be a good watch a second time around Um, but yeah thumbs up from you what do you think any final thoughts Uh, no it was fine it was was a nice sort of um, uh, story to watch Um, uh, uh, every point i was like i wonder what's going to happen here was so yeah i've got no complaints i thought it was an alright film yeah um i probably won't revisit it i don't need to i've seen the story i, I don't, um, i'm not i'm not going to gain anything more from it <clears throat> did you did you watch this with sarah yeah we did actually yeah i should imagine sarah enjoyed this because i know that she i think so she um was quite passionate about that munchausen by proxy episode and i I think it is a bit of a there's a lot of stories about this out there at the moment that seem to it seems to really tweak people's interest for some reason um because it's 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 actually a fairly popular episode of us yeah and it's such a thing that just happens in plain sight to people in the real world Mm. and people don't know about it until only really in the last 20 years people are really understanding it now Mm. um well it's a thumbs up from you it's definitely a thumbs up from me and of course rachel let's let's hear your thoughts now so um let me find that part of the message here it is so i've picked run by anish changati and mum and dad by brian taylor that oh i've already read that bit sorry i do apologize uh run run absolutely blew me away both times that i've watched it i think we can all agree that sarah paulson is a horror screen queen by now definitely in the fan horror hall of fame she I know, plays I, sorry, I still love the fact that I was like, that's the first thing I've ever seen her in. <laughs> I feel but bad. But it's, it's the same when... Um, but I haven't seen American Horror Story. That's where it, she is. It comes happens, in, yeah. so. Like, when I mentioned Mick Garris once, you're like, nah, Mick Garris, no one really knows who he is. And I was like, what do you mean, Mick Garris? Everyone knows who Mick Garris is. He's directed loads of Stephen King stuff. He's all, And then after a while, you're like, yeah, I suppose I've just not seen a lot of the stuff he's done. It's just these people escape your radar I don't like Mick Garris radar movies. Sometimes. You do. Okay. We talked about. We had this exact conversation I before. Don't. Okay, you do because we had this conversation before, and you're like, "Oh, actually, I do like quite a few of these." I don't. Okay. Um, Sarah Paulson is a horror screen queen by now, definitely in the Femme Horror Hall of Fame, and she plays her character here so well. Her daughter Chloe is a wheelchair user in real life. I thought that was awesome. She's an amazing girl. I love the direction. That was the thing that blew me away, actually, Rach and Gav, is some of the scenes this girl had to do being in a wheelchair herself like the scene dragging herself across the roof and all that stuff like this is a real wheelchair user she had to do all of this it's awesome um i love the direction i love the big swooping close-up when the pharmacist says this is dog medication yeah, i no, love yeah. that that it, was a hitchcock moment it, wasn't I was it? literally about to say that yeah it's all that that was like that was also like the push pull 
jewel shot as well mm. it was all of those sort of classics um very good stuff this the do- it's dog medication me and alice were like what like audibly said that you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's just like that is awesome didn't expect that um the mother is standing in the dark um when she turns the internet off the very quick start i liked this it got straight into the suspicion and the mayhem yeah agreed rach um you know, it didn't fuck about it. It was five, ten minutes in, and she was already finding out about the tablets and thinking, well, hang on a minute, something weird's going on here. Um, it was all great. I also got major misery vibes. When Sarah was locked in the wheelchair in the bedroom, and then she went to the cinema, that was all very Gypsy Rose Blanchard. So some nice nods to some fictional and factual horror. Munchausen's by proxy has always fascinated me. Obviously horrific thing, but psychologically fascinating. So this really did everything I wanted, and it's a near-perfect movie for me. What an ending. So she liked the ending too. Um, and then I'll finish off her message, because um, when we come back from our little break in a minute it'll be our outro so she says all in all both of these get a solid 90 odd percent maybe even a hundred on rachel's tomatoes i've never heard of this rachel's tomatoes gap have you (laughs) (laughs) well well, um i hope (laughs) maybe we should catch up maybe we should um she says i hope you guys both enjoyed them as much as i did lots of love to you both and then she said to me hey that's okay i was like mate that's brilliant I said to her, you don't want to write anything, just write a a sentence. But she did a brilliant job, picked two great films, very... I Uh, never would have thought... Mm. Yeah, and I never would have thought the conversation that mum and dad brought out of us, all about parenting and midlife crisis and all that kind of stuff. And then, obviously, we've had a chance to chat about Unchosen's by Proxy, and we've still thrown in silly things like Postman Pat and Gav hating soldering irons and mouthfuls of water and all that kind of stuff. I've sent you a picture on WhatsApp. You sent me a picture on WhatsApp. I dread to think what you sent me. Hang on a minute. This is live. Gav <laughs> <laughs> sent me a picture of Chloe with a mouthful of water crawling across the roof. It does look ridiculous, but I embrace the ridiculous, Gav. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy with that. Um I loved both of these movies, Rachel. Thank you for that. Thank you for being a patron. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you for your support. And um, you get to keep the crown on till the very end. So, um, Thank you, uh, Rachel, for those suggestions. Yes, it's nice, actually. Yeah, both different type of films. We probably wouldn't cover them or get to them. A run, possibly. Mum and Dad, possibly. I don't, wouldn't be high on the list, though. So that's, I would have watched good. Mum and Dad. We, we probably, probably would have covered, covered that. We, maybe, maybe with a Nicolas Cage, I don't know. But, I don't know. Um, but it's think... good, to, good to do other films, and that's what the Patreon thing's about. So thank what? you, uh, patrons, for your well, I, sol- I'll tell choices. you now, I'm a- Mum and Dad was on the list, and it was paired up with the British Mum and Dad. Oh, my um, no. Which is an awful film. That's like, grubby. Good, but, yeah. And I thought those two would be good, but um, we, we, it's all good. We've got, got to cover it this way. We don't need to talk about the grubby Mum and Dad. With oh, Let's not go into what goes happening in that film. Um, all right. Well, that is all of our reviews. That is World of the Strange. Gav, should we have a little breathe in, breathe out, and then come back and do the outro? Yeah, let's go. We're back again. We're back again. So that was uh, episode 143. It was a patron pick. It was Rachel. She was our queen. And we really enjoyed talking about Postman Pat and millions of other tangents. Thank you ever so much, Rachel. You never Rachel. really say Postman Pat about saying, <laughs> and his black and, and white. And his black and white cat. cat. It just comes with the, it's the whole package. It's like, if you want to be with me, that's what Postman Pat says on date when he does these Tinder dates and he meets up with them. If you want to be with me, I'll come with a cat. And that's I thought you is. were. See, I thought you were quoting the Spice Girls then. If you want to be, if you want to be with me, oh, yeah. gotta gotta get my friends. Gotta get with my cat, my black and white cat. I think the Spice Girls say, "If you want to get with me, gotta get with my friends." Gotta get with my friends. What does that you. mean? Does that mean if you want to get with me? No, no, sh- no Shag all my friends first. No, I, I used to think about this. I actually know it was to most to Spice it. Girls songs. It was really bad. I hate yeah, it. I, I, worked well. in a, I worked in a cafe, uh, well, like a restaurant, and inside the kitchen on the radio, that shit was just on all the time. 
Anyway, um, it's about getting with my friends. You got to be friends with uh, my friends. Uh, yeah, you've got to. You, my friends have got to like if you. If you want to be with me, my friends have got. To, yeah, we've got to be down. But what does Zig Zig R mean then, Gav? Well, I yeah, mean, it's a bit. Of... Boom, hey. boom, boom. <laughs> All I know is the rap is very rude. We've got Mel in the place who likes it in the face. Oh, I've never really somebody, thought about it. Break one it down. of the MCs in Easy V doesn't come for free. She's a real lady. And, and, as, and as for me, well, you'll, <laughs> you'll see. see. Something time, something, something. Slam your body down and wind it all around. There we go, Rach. We've ended up oh. as a Spice Girl Olympics. If you want to be my lover. Yeah. Something tells me that Rachel would have been into the Spice Girls back in the 90s. Making love forever. Then. What never ends? It never no, ends. No, it's not making love forever. What is it? It's, um, if you want to be my lover, you've got to get with my friends. Yeah. Taking this too easy. Friendship never ends. Oh, I changed it. Gav wants to make love forever. I just want to be friends forever. Imagine the friction if you weren't making love forever. It, it's just going to get it's just going to get worn down to a little nub, isn't it? Nubby, little nubby. Well, that was episode 143 little, little and we've celebrated nub, nub. Pa- patrons, we've, we've celebrated nubbins, postman pats, we've celebrated, <laughs> we celebrated s- nubbins. Star Wars Sanctuary Moon. <laughs> what it's day is it today? Out. It's nubbin celebration day. Listen, listen, it's Star Wars Sanctuary Moon is out there. Get listeners, the, if you haven't already, go duster. watch it. If you have Start seen it, nubbin it down. Watch it again. Watch, watch Star it. Star Wars Sanctuary Moon, times. watch it. Um, yeah, do watch it or share it with someone you know who likes Star Wars. Just say, do you like this? Or but, someone who but, likes horror. It's not probably not suitable for under six or under seven uh, or eight. And also, weirdly, um, <laughs> a lot of Star Wars fans aren't enjoying it as much as the horror fans in that there's a lot of Star Wars fans are being turned off by some of the gore in it, which is fine because in Star Wars you don't really get too much gore. So I understand that angle. So it's really somewhere in the middle there for some Star Wars fans that are horror and vice versa. It's a weird one because we've basically mixed together Star Wars and uh, and horror. Uh, basically, I made a horror movie and I just put the, the characters happen to have costumes on which were Stormtroopers. But I've <laughs> made a horror movie first. So. Always. Mm. Um, um, so it's a weird one. So I think people are just trying to figure it out at the moment. But it's, I'm hoping it catches it catches up and it goes on a big wave. Um, I was missold as well because um, when the project was coming together, I just kept hearing we're going to go and film lots of helmets in the woods, and I thought this is going to be great. It, yeah, it's not that. Movie. It wasn't that. It was it. No. It wasn't, wasn't that kind of movie. No. Um, but there we go. Um, well, that was episode 143, Gav. What is coming up next? I can hear you asking. By the way, Rachel, I need to take that crown back off your head. Thank you so much for being a great queen for the episode. Now, next episode is episode 144. And we're going to New York in the early 80s. Oh, God. Cannibalistic humanoid underground dweller, Chud. I'll be interested to see the ending for the first time. And Basket Case. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen that for a long time. Early eighties. Case. We're getting dirty in the eighties, New York. I I watched a movie the other day called Brain Damage, which I haven't seen for a long time. And there's a crossover in there where Basket Case is in it for a split second. Really? Same. I think it's same director. Um, that's why. Uh, so that's 144 Chud and Basket Case. Then we'll be heading into December because we'll be kicking December off with Twilight Zone and Cat's Eye. A couple of anthology movies. Um, We'll have lots to talk about with Twilight Zone, the movie, because there were some tragedies in real life around that. Um, And then, Gavin, it'll be our Christmas special. Also, our 10-year anniversary episode. I know. So I'll be starting to get comments and messages from people soon. I'll be putting that out. Don't worry. And any voice Um, clips, if anybody wants to, uh, 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 you know... Send in yeah, a anything. voice thing, say hello to us and happy t- uh, 10 years podcast. Wouldn't that be lovely? And for that episode, we'll be having a fairly relaxed one. We'll be celebrating 10 years of podcasting, but it will be Christmas as always. So we will be, we've decided it's not horror. And, well, no, it's not horror. I can't even lie. There are some elements in it which are weird, but it's not horror. We're going to be covering National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Because <laughs> yeah. If we can't talk about that on our 10-year Christmas annual episode anniversary thing, then when can we? 
I know. It's it's yeah. I know that I don't even really need to do notes, to be honest with yeah. you. I could yeah. literally should we should we just We could do it now. Freestyle it. Uh, uh, um, I will make notes because with a reviewer's eye, there will be a few things I like. I okay. always write down things I like. I might freestyle it because I know that film very, very, very well. I have good, good memories of watching that film with my family, but also with you. Uh, yeah, um, I've watched it every Boxing Day for probably 25 years. So I've seen it then probably about 25 times. So Yeah, I'm, I've I'm easily, easily seen it 20, 20 or so times, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So I'm first in that film. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, that's that's the next three episodes, and then we'll be heading into 2024. And I've programmed a schedule for 2024. I'm not going to tell anybody what it is now, but I will say that where there isn't a patron episode or a birthday special, that year, to celebrate our 10th year of podcasting, we will be mainly doing director specials. So whenever there isn't a patron special or there isn't a birthday, we will be doing either a patron, um, a director special or a franchise. Yeah, Yeah, or a franchise. franchise. There's a couple of franchises we'll be finishing up next year. Um, And there's a lot of directors that we're going to be looking at pairings of their work as well. Directors we haven't touched on, some we already have as well. John Carpenter, I'm looking at you. We'll be coming back for another John Carpenter special. (laughs) Uh, But that's it, Gav. That's it from me. So... Yeah. I'll get some admin done and then we'll say our goodbyes, all right? Alvi de Zanes. Alvi de Zane. Don't know why I said it in such an offensive <laughs> German accent. I was really channeling sort of Indiana Jones baddies then when I did that, and I'm so sorry to our German listeners. I could have just said Alvi de Zane, which is the normal way of doing it. <laughs> well, you've been listening to the podcast on Haunted Hill. We're a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Uh, you can find out more about Legion Podcast Network if you go to legionpodcast.com. There's lots and lots of shows that might tickle your fancy there. I've Ooh. mentioned some of them in the intro, uh, such as Cinema Psyops or Ricky's uh, Ricky Morgan's Doctor Movie MD or the other 25 shows that Ricky does. Also, I've been on a show that those two guys collaborate on called Mental Rentals. I've been on that show and we reviewed an Olivia Newton-John film called what? Xanadu. The fuck is that? Uh, it's great. That's all I'm going to say. Really? Xanadu. I'm not watching Xanadu. Xanadu. So thanks, thanks for you, to you guys for having me on for that one. Xanadu. Um, do you like that? I do. I think we, we used that joke when we, when we talked about the film. Um, we are available for more information. <laughs> you put me off in that bit. <laughs> if you want to find out more about us or you want to join in with the banter, go to the Facebook page the podcast on Haunted Hill. We did have some porn spam happening for about two weeks in a row, but through my efforts, I seem to have stopped that now. I know that the Legion main page, which again, the Legion podcast main page is also on Facebook. That was now getting spammed by porn, but Court Psyops has single-handedly defeated all of the images of women's bits and men's bits. Um, I've been reporting it. He's been deleting it. We've managed to, between us, Sort that Where's out. Where's it coming from? Bots. Bots. But w- w- um, how are they getting to us? So what I've done is I've turned the Facebook page. Our Facebook page was a public page. I've now turned it into a private page so that you can only join us if you ask to join. And if we get any more porn spam, I will be adding three questions which any new members need to answer to join us uh, to find out if they're real humans who like horror films and podcasting. Um, but anyway, enough about porn spam. Yes, we're on Facebook, so is Legion. And we have an email address, which is the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook.com. You can email us there, ask us questions, ask, make suggestions, uh, tell us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, or just tell us to fuck off. It's really up to you. Um, wherever you're listening to us now is where you can continue to listen to us. Places like Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, and many, many other places we are available to get in your ear holes, Gav, aren't we? Ear holes. In them. Uh, we're also on Instagram, um, which is mainly where I promote um, with a nice little collage after each episode, the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. Um, we've talked about Sanctuary Moon again. Go watch it. Go watch it. Go watch it. Tell us what you think. That is through our company, Deadbolt Films. We have a website, deadboltfilms.com. We have a YouTube channel, Deadbolt Films. We are on Instagram under Deadbolt Films. 
please go watch other things that we've done tell us what you think of sanctuary moon tell us what you think of anything we've done what you want to see what you don't want to see whether the music was too loud or whether the stormtroopers are just too sexy whatever it is tell us and finally patron 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 thank you patrons <coughs> thank you patron supporters so so much uh, uh, always massively 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 appreciated if you want to become a patron even if we didn't have patrons as gav always says we would continue to do this podcast but the fact that we have a few people supporting us and monetary it, it just makes us uh, makes it always feel so much nicer that it's like oh of course like a it's like a, I don't know. It makes it special for us. It just takes the pressure off as well. It means that we have a little bit of funding for equipment, for renting or buying more obscure films, um, and we really appreciate you guys so much. To become a patron, go to Patreon and search the podcast on Haunted Hill. You can, if you can't do that or you can't find that, message me or either on Facebook or again the podcast on Haunted Hill at Outlook dot com. I will direct you to our, our Patreon uh, page and as little as a pound or a dollar a month um you can become a patron and if you become a patron you get a free t-shirt in one of three colors in your size um we will ship that to you wherever in the galaxy you live <coughs> definitely definitely at some point you will get it i know don Coyer took about 75 years to get here sorry about that don you will also get your chance to pick a patron episode so every three episodes we drop our normal schedule and it is picked by a patron um we are coming to well we've come to the end of our first run of patrons now so our next patron will be going back to matthew godley who started who came up with this whole shenanigans yeah um so in january we will be looking at two films that he's already excitedly picked out for us which is good stuff um and not only that but you also get access to episodes early you get bonus episodes and we're unleashing every friday freaky friday an old episode of the podcast on haunted hill gets released to our patrons so you'll have videos. every episode a few video episodes as well on there yeah a few done. other bits and bobs so a few bits of bonus content as well uh, and the video stuff is stuff you've not seen before and it's me like um, um going through like different films in my collection and just like uh, just talking about them and talk about artwork and stuff like that and just things like that which is stuff which you won't see unless you're a patron and there's some random videos of voice audio of me doing an, a retrospective of the entire three seasons of Twin Peaks Buffy the Vampire Slayer and a few other things as well uh, I need to get back on that a bit more now my children are a bit older I, I, I'm starting to have a little bit more freer time occasionally uh, well just so. do, do what what horror do a list of what horror is good for children and do your age of your children at the time and just as they go just do that Record that's a good one yeah. what is good for two year olds yeah do it the, the thing aliens <laughs> um also, the funny thing that patrons get is their name read out in a silly voice at the end of every episode. So I'm about to thank all of our patrons. I love now. the fact that you've just adopted this for you to do every time now. You get a t-shirt, you get you pick your episodes, you get a bonus content, Gav, you get all the back catalogue, and then you get a silly voice. What more could a man want or a woman want in life? Hmm? Hmm? So, as always, thank you to our patrons. And those patrons are... Don Coyer. Thank you. Matthew Godley. Thank you. Oh, Jimmy Jenkins. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin S. Five. Oh, apologise from Dan here. Thank you. Sarah K. Thank you. Ah, oh, Rachel. <laughs> Cool, thank you. Sorry, that's my Irish accent. I know, that's such a fuck off. <laughs> RJ McCready. Thank you. And la 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 boo 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 boo. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. We love you all very, very much. We do. Um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful episode. Wonderbar. Wonderbar, wonderful episode. And have always have a blast, um, especially these patron episodes, because they're movies that we would never have picked it's no. great yeah, um and you guys write some of the content for me because i just have to read out your message <laughs> i've given away my secrets um gav it's a good night from postman pat it's a good night from his black and white cat oh 
It's a good night from Dan, crawling on Gab's roof with a mouthful of water and a soldering iron, daisy chained, all the way back to the other room. Slowly, 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 and just as I get there, oh, oh, I fucking swallowed it. I've got to go back and do it all over again. <laughs> yeah, it's a good night from a man who's just been slapped by a woman being fingered. Wow. And it's a good night from Nicholas Cage smashing up his pool table because he goes, You can't have titties in my face like I used to. He's angry about the non titty driving donut. 